In the trial, the defendants are in court with their attorneys. The prosecution is represented, and we have both juries in the courtroom. I have belated good morning to all of you. And good morning. Sorry again for the delay, but I think you'll hear me saying that a few more times during the trial. Uh, there were some matters that uh, the lawyers and I had to discuss. It took a little bit longer, but uh, we completed those discussions and we're ready to resume with the uh, trial and uh, the cross-examination of uh, the witness. Uh, Dr. Ozeal, would you get back on the witness stand, please? Again, for the record, Dr. L. Jerome Ozeal. And I'll remind you, you're still under oath. Um, those papers over there, if you can give those to me, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, you may continue your cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I want to uh, mark as Exhibit 110 a document that's previously been described as the witness's uh, CV, but I want to show it to you for sure. I'm going to show you again this document. Uh, and ask if that does appear to be your uh, curriculum vita from 1988, at least that's the date on the top. Uh, that's the date on the top, and I believe that I testified that uh, it looks like a completely um, out-of-date curriculum vita. Well, of course, it also has a later, later date entries than 1988. It has 1990 television appearances, does it not? I believe that does it does only with respect to television appearances, and I, I to best my knowledge, somebody simply typed that in because nothing else is dated beyond uh, something that uh, uh, that I can see that looks like it's uh, beyond the 70s. It looks like a, an out of date Vita that at some point was accurate and is now out of date. But that's uh, you haven't found a more recent date one yet, have you? Um, no, as a matter of fact, I can't uh, currently um, locate the file where my Vita's. I haven't found the videos at all. My real question is, though, isn't that the same document I showed you before? Yes, it is. Now, Dr. Ozio, um, you've testified about this <clears throat> session uh, of October 31st, 1989. That session began with just yourself and my client, Eric, present. Is that right? That's correct. Now, Eric didn't just walk in off the street for this session. He had an appointment with you. Is that right? To the best of my recollection, that's correct. Usually, it's, you don't have walk-ins. You have appointments. That's correct. <clears throat> and do you remember how long before October 31st the appointment was made? No, I don't. I think it was uh, sometime within a, a couple of days of that particular appointment, but I don't recall specifically. Do you recall now what day of the week that particular appointment was? No, I don't. Uh, what day it was? No, I don't. Would it refresh your recollection to look at your 1989 book? Yes, it probably would. Let me show you the page that shows October 31st, 1989. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes, it does. It was a Tuesday, was it not? Um, yes, it appears to be Tuesday. Now, your regular practice in 1989, based on other weeks as well, was that you would uh, see patients ordinarily on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday as full days. Is that right? I'm sorry, can you uh, give me the book so I can refresh sure. my memory? And what was it you asked, counsel? Could you repeat the question? Why don't you look at the book first, then I can ask you a question. Okay. I'm looking at it. Does it refresh your memory looking at the book? Uh, if you can ask the question again, I will address the question. Did you ordinarily in 1989 see patients on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday? Um, yes, but I also see myself seeing people on Thursday. You have a full day of patients on Thursdays? Uh, not usually, but I do see patients on Thursdays. Do you have a full day of patients on Thursdays? Objection day to when? Specify the time, please. In the book in front of you, do you see a single Thursday that has a full day of patients? I'd have to look at all, uh, at all 50 weeks. Did you want me to do that? 
All right, whatever it takes for you to be able to answer a question. Okay. Overall, the, the question relates to the entire year or to a particular portion of the year? The entire year, I think it's the same. It, it appears as I'm looking through the book that, uh, that I see partial days Thursday, but not uh, that I haven't seen a full day. There are days when I see half days, but uh, I don't see a, f a full day, with the exception of um, uh, one day here that, that relates to the current uh, case where I have a uh, full day. Now, let's go back to the week of October 31st. You did not have a day of patience that Monday, the day before, the 30th. Is that right? Um, <clears throat> no, I did not. At, you're usually off on Mondays, correct? Well, when you say off, do you, can you clarify what you mean do by you off? Do you usually go into your office on Bedford Drive and see patients on Mondays? Not. Are you asking, did he, in, on that? Indeed, Your Honor, okay. I am. Okay. Uh, it does not appear I did. You don't remember? No, I'm just saying that it, there are no patients scheduled. I may have been in the office, but I don't have any appointment scheduled. Sometimes I went to the office to do work. Do you know where you were on October 30th, 1989? Uh, no. Do you know where you were on Sunday, October 29th, 1989? No. Do you know that you were in Arizona with Judalon Smith those two days? Uh, Overall. Yeah, I, I don't recall at all where I was those days. You did go to Arizona with Judalon Smith on at least one occasion, did you not? Um, on some occasion I did, yes. Do you know where you were when, I'll strike that, uh, did you become aware of Eric needing to see you, put it that way, before Eric actually made the appointment? I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Were you contacted by one of Eric's relatives? Uh, yes, I was. And uh, after that contact by one of, and was that a telephone contact? Uh, to the best of my recollection, it was. And after that telephone contact, did Eric himself call to make an appointment? Uh, yes, he did. Do you remember physically where you were when Eric called to make the appointment? Um, no, I don't. Would it refresh your recollection if I told you you were at Judalon Smith's house? No, because that's not what I recall. Well, you just told us you don't recall where you were. No, but I don't recall. I have no memory of uh, being at Judalon Smith's house and receiving any call. But you have no memory of where you were when this call came. Is that true? No, I don't. So you could have been at Judalon Smith's house when the call came. It's, it's possible. Anything's possible. You did visit Judalon Smith's house before you went there to stay on October 31st, didn't you? I'm sorry? You had visited Judalon Smith's house before October 31st? Yes, I had. Now, for how many nights did you stay at Judalon Smith's house commencing October 31st? Um, I don't recall, but it was uh, several nights. The next session that you had with Eric and Lyle was November 2nd, correct? That's correct. That was a Thursday. That's correct. And do you recall what you did that weekend, the weekend beginning November 4th, Saturday, and November 5th, Sunday? Yes, I certainly do. Did you go to Newport Beach? I certainly did. With Jude Lon Smith? Yes, I did, with Jude Lon Smith. <coughs> On Monday, November 6, 1989, did you purchase guns? Yes, I did. And what kind of guns did you purchase on Monday, November 6th? Shotguns. And how many shotguns did you purchase on Monday, November 6th? Um, to the best of my recollection, three, although I don't recall whether I purchased all three at the same time or not. Finally, 
And did anyone accompany you to make this shotgun purchase? Um, I don't recall. I think, um, I think my wife did, but I don't recall. And was this just something that happened on the spur of the moment you and your wife were driving by the gun store and you said, hey, let's jump in there? Or did you plan to buy shotguns that day? Um, no, we decided to buy shotguns based upon the threats that we perceived were uh, emanating uh, with respect to uh, Eric and Lyle. Well, let me ask you this. When did you make the decision to buy the shotguns? Was it on November 6th, or was it the day before, or two days before, or three days before? When exactly did you decide? There's no way for me to determine exactly the moment a decision to buy the shotguns. I don't know. Do you think it was before the day that you actually bought them? I don't know. And this was a decision that you and your wife reached jointly? I believe that that was a decision that we reached jointly. And do you recall if you were at home when you made that decision? Um, to the best of my recollection, I was. And therefore, in order to follow through on this decision, you had to leave home, go to a store that sold shotguns, buy shotguns, right? To the best of my recollection. Did you buy ammunition, too? Um, yes. What kind? I don't recall. Do you know what load? Um, I don't even recall what load is, meaning... Uh, load is the size of the pellets that go into a shotgun shell. No, I don't. I just, whatever, uh, whatever the person said was normally uh, used is what, uh, is what we bought. And before you went to, did you go to a gun store, a sporting goods store, or what? Um, we went to, I think, a big five sporting goods store. And when you got to the Big Five Sporting Goods Store, did you ask um, whoever waited on you to explain shotguns to you or show you how they worked, or did you already know? Um, I don't recall having asked that person anything in particular. You just said, I want three of those? Um, I think that I asked for uh, whatever the least expensive shotgun was and, and simply uh, asked for whatever cartridges fit, and, and that's I, it's a fit. You know, for that particular uh, shotgun, and, and uh, I, to the best of my recollection, that's what happened. Did you sign for the guns? Um, I believe so. Signed your name? Yes, I believe I did. Do you remember there were some forms that were being made out? Do you remember those forms? Um, I, I think there were some forms, but I don't recall what they, uh, what they were. Do you remember any yellow forms? I don't remember any particular forms. I remember there were forms, but I don't recall what the forms were. And uh, then you took these uh, three shotguns and the ammunition you had bought back to your house? I don't recall immediately what I did. I just re recall that we bought the shotguns. At some time on that day, Monday, November 6, did you take one of those shotguns to Judalon Smith's house? Um, at some point, I did take one of the shotguns to Judalon Smith's house, uh, believing as I... Well, Your Honor, I would object to anything after the question is answered. That's not All right, you could have answered that one, yes. Okay. Could have. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Your next question. And uh, when I ask you, did you take a gun to Judalon Smith's house, did you leave one of the shotguns at Judalon Smith's house? Uh, yes, I did. Between, uh, what time did the session with Eric and Lyle end on November the 2nd? I don't recall. Well, how long did it last? I, I don't recall. Again, I don't have my session notes, so I... You do have your session notes, don't you? Oh, have I'm chance? sorry. I have my book in front of me. I'm not uh, used to having that. Um, it says here, three and a half hours. Three and a half hours. Is that's that right? What it, that's what it says. 
Now, does that mean three and a half hours, or does it mean three and a half 45-minute hours? I mean, is it a 60-minute hour or a 45-minute hour? Well, I don't know. Um, meaning, uh, it, she's written down, and, and the she is, it's not my handwriting, uh, three and a half hours. And usually three and a half hours means three and a half hours. It doesn't like mean normal 60-minute hours. Minute hours. Right. Whereas the three and a half sessions usually would indicate three and a half 45-minute sessions, usually. Okay. But I don't know what she was thinking when she wrote this. Well, maybe if you figure out how much you charge, we'd know. So we want to look at the ledger, 97. Okay. Um, I want to look at 88. Look at 88. Okay. Now, showing you what's been marked, 97B. And... Uh, calling your attention to November the 2nd. You see that on there, don't you? November 2nd. It says three and a half hours. And the billing is for $700. Is that right? That's what it says. And does that compute as three and a half hours? I can't do that in my head. Well, let's see. Um, each, uh, give me a moment and I'll calculate it out. You want a pen? Um, no, I think I can do it in my head. Go ahead. Uh, it does, roughly. Three and a half hours, not three and a half sessions. Three and a half hours. Okay. What time did it start? You have your book. Um, well, I'm not sure that it started uh, when it's written in the book because it's a Thursday. I have no other people scheduled and it's just written in the middle of the page. So, so they could have come in at any time. I, I don't recall when they came in. Okay. So whenever they came in, three and a half hours roughly later, they leave. That's right? correct. And? From that moment when they left on that day until the moment you bought shotguns on November 6th, had you spoken to or seen either Eric or Lyle? Uh, no, to the best of my recollection, I hadn't. Okay. But would it be uh, accurate to say that between the time they left and the time that you purchased shotguns on Monday, November 6th, something had happened or not happened that increased your fear? That certainly is correct. Now, was the thing that had happened or not happened the fact that although during the session the brothers had told you they were going to go to Hawaii on vacation, you were unable to confirm that they had gone to Hawaii on vacation. I, I wouldn't be able to answer the question the way you posed it. Well, for, let's, why don't we start with that question? Maybe we can move along. Had they told you they were going to Hawaii on vacation? Um, yes, they had. Had you given them recommendations of places to stay in Hawaii? I think that they asked me for one recommendation for a place to stay on Hawaii. On and the, you gave Hawaii. it to them? I did. Okay. Did you attempt to verify after that session whether or not they had, first of all, gone on vacation? Yes, I did. And were you unable to verify it? Specifically, were you unable can't to Can't answer verify? the question that way. Fine. But you went and bought shotguns on November 6th, right? That's correct. And would it be accurate to say that you received no communicated threat from them directly, nor from the mail, nor from anyone else saying they're going to get you, or anything like that, between the last time you saw them on November 2nd and the purchase of the shotguns on November 6th? A communicated threat. Overall. I perceive that I received a communicated threat. Oh, tell the juries what the threat was. Okay. Describe, not other things, the threat. There wasn't a specific threatened communication, but okay, there was information answered. that was threatening. He's answered the question, you and I, well, never mind. All right, had you finished your answer? Um, if, if the court... You can um, say yes or no, had you finished your answer? No. <laughs> Well, Your Honor, I think that does answer the question, and anything else I believe would call for hearsay. And I will lay a foundation for that, if you will. You talked to somebody else, right? Yes, I did. You talked to a relative, right? That's correct. The relative said she didn't know they were going out of town, right? That's not correct. All right. But the relative told you something. She certainly did. 
And that's what frightened you even more. That's correct. Okay. We clarify relative of whom? You spoke to their grandmother. That's correct. She didn't threaten you, did she? No, she didn't threaten me. Now, let's fast forward ahead here for a moment. At some point, okay, at some point, you found out, did you not, that in fact they had gone on vacation. They just didn't go where they told you they were going, right? No. No, I don't recall that. All you right. don't recall ever? Wait, wait, wait. One thing at a time. We have an objection. Objections overrule. The answer will stand. Thank you. You never found out that in fact either of the Menendez brothers had gone on vacation. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that I don't recall having found out they went on vacation <coughs> during that specific time period. I don't recall that. Any time during the month of November, did you ever learn that they had gone on vacation during the month of November? Don't have a recollection of that. <laughs> but I take it, given your high state of anxiety and fear, the fact that they hadn't gone where you thought they had gone just made you more fearful, made you worried. Would that be accurate? No, it wouldn't. Okay. Isn't that why you left town also? You were so frightened you went to Newport. You didn't even want to be in L.A. Um, Your Honor, I, well, I didn't get a chance to respond well, to your well, first if, question. If you can't answer the question or you don't understand, just say I can't answer it. Can't understand. answer that question. Okay, fine. Now, later in the month of November, after November 6th, did you also take steps to increase the, or change, or fix, or something, to the security system at your home? Yes, we took a number of measures to increase the security at our home. To the best of your knowledge, uh, Dr. Azeel, when were <coughs> our clients arrested? Um, sometime in March, but I don't recall when, I believe. Sometime in March of 1990. Uh, I'm guessing. You would certainly know the date. I, I don't well, know I the date. I move to strike that, Your Honor. Is what I know or don't know Objection is... Objection overruled. The answer will stand. Okay. Your next question, please. Were they arrested after that search warrant was served on your house, if you know? Yes. Now, um... Do you know whether or not the security system on your home was fixed on November the 19th? No, I wouldn't recall the exact date that it was fixed. Between the date of November, I'll strike that, between the date of October 31st, 1989, and March 8th, 1990, the day of the search warrant, to the best of your knowledge, did either Eric or Lyle break into your house? No, they did not to the best of my knowledge. To the best of your knowledge, did they ever come to Miss Smith's house? To the best of my knowledge, no. You never saw them there? No, I didn't. And nobody else ever reported to you that they had seen them there? No one did. And I take it no one ever harmed you physically, nor any member of your family, nor Miss Smith. Is that right? I would say that would be uh, accurate, physically. Do you right now, as you sit here today, Dr. Ozeal, feel harmed by the Menendez brothers? Um, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, you just said, no, not physically. So I assume there was some other kind of harm that you had in the back of your mind. Am I correct? Um, what I meant to say by that is that obviously there's been a lot of um, distress in relationship to all this, fear, yes. things of that nature. You uh, so. have suffered, and your family has suffered a lot of distress. Is that true? I would say that there's uh, been distress that's been significant, yes. Very significant, hasn't it? Fairly significant, yes. You got a lot of publicity that you didn't particularly like as a result of this case. Wouldn't that be a truthful statement? 
I said I would think that that would be a truthful statement. And you wound up in a fair amount of litigation that I'm sure you would have rather avoided, but for this, isn't that a fair statement? I think that's a very fair statement. Uh, and has that litigation cost <coughs> you personally any money? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. Well, can I be heard on that? Uh, go on to something else uh -huh. and I'll come back to it. Now, I'm correct, am I not, in assuming, Dr. Ozil, that you certainly don't blame yourself for causing any of this distress or any of this harm or any of this litigation or trouble or bad press. It's not your fault, is it? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. Your Honor, I would like to be heard. Sure. Thank you. Mm. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Dr. Ozeal, let me ask you this question. Do you blame yourself for all these troubles? I blame no one for all these troubles. Just fate. Is that it? To a great extent. Now, you've testified that uh, Eric Menendez knew where you lived. Is that right? That's correct. In fact, didn't you use your home address on all of your billing envelopes to all of your patients? Uh, it, it was not identified as my home address to any of my patients. So yes, I did, but it was not identified. Uh, said Longridge Avenue, right? Did not identify that it was my home. It said Longridge Avenue, it didn't did, it? Did in fact. <laughs> and what Longridge was the Avenue. township? Sherman Oaks. Sherman Oaks. Okay. That's correct. And it wouldn't take very long for someone to figure out that Longridge Avenue in Sherman Oaks is an upper middle class residential street and not a business zone, would it? I wouldn't know. I'd be speculating. It didn't look like a business district while you were living there, did it? If you were on the street, it didn't. And every one of your patients, therefore, had your address in which to send their payments to, correct? Uh, they had it for the purpose of sending in payments, yes. And in fact, you, the main office of your business, at least for record keeping purposes, I believe you've already told us, was in that house on Longridge Avenue, correct? That's correct. But in fact, you recall, do you not, that Eric actually came to your home on an occasion to pick something up from you. True? Uh, Kitty and Eric both came. That's okay. correct. And what he came to pick up from you is a report you had written for him, is that right? That's correct. Dr. Ozeal, you've already testified that on November 1st, and the book's right in front of you, you did go into your office in Beverly Hills and you did see patients. You remember that? Yes, I do. And that office of yours in Beverly Hills, um, would you describe for the jury what the physical setup is? <laughs> to the best of my ability. Um, the office is laid out such that there's a a waiting room when you, uh, or, by the way, I'm not in that office so uh, currently, so I'm describing a, a former office, so that there is a waiting room um, uh, as you walk in, and th it's sort of L-shaped. There then is a door, which is a locked door that leads from the waiting room into the consultation sessions, uh, the session rooms, and the session rooms are laid out so that there is um, immediately one consultation office as one walks down the corridor then it's an L you walk down a longer corridor maybe 20 feet or so from the waiting room door that is closed and um, then there is a session door that actually leads into my office my office being the furthest office away from the waiting room there being two consultation offices between my office and the waiting room door which is locked in respect, with respect to uh, people coming out the street. 
Do other uh, psychotherapists use the other two offices during the day, or did they then? Uh, yes, other psychotherapists did. And who were the other psychotherapists who used those other offices uh, in or around November 1st, 1989? Um, there were several that I can think of off the top of my head. I can't tell you the totality of all the therapists. Why don't you just tell us what you remember? I'd be happy to. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Dennis Munjak um, used uh, one of the offices. Um, I believe that uh, Dr. Deborah Phillips used one of the other offices, and I think that she also shared uh, that office with uh, my wife, who's a psychotherapist, um, Laurel Ozeal. Um, and there were several other um, part time psychiatrists, um, psychologists. Uh, who also, from time to time, uh, used those offices. Was there, was one uh, gentleman with the last name Solomon? Uh, Richard Solomon? To the best of my recollection, Richard Solomon hasn't been in, it wasn't in use of those offices any time near the time that I was seeing the Menendez's. Well, did he ever use those offices during the time that you used them? Um, I don't even know that he ever used my office. He might have used an office in that suite sometime in the past 15 years. Do you know Richard Solomon? Yes, I do. Is he a psychotherapist? Yes, he is. Did he ever use any of the offices in that suite? Um, I believe he did. Now, did you on either October 31st or November 1st give any kind of warning or caution to Dr. Phillips or Dr. Munjak? Um, yes, I did. And who did you warn and when? Um, I don't recall when I um, uh, warned them. I think I warned them as soon as possible after the, um, the uh, events transpired. Um, who? And Dr. Munjak and Dr. Phillips. Okay. Um, and the warning that I uh, gave them was that there, there, um, there could potentially be a dangerous patient situation and they should be especially sure to make sure that the uh, premises uh, were secured and if they felt that they wanted to uh, take any steps uh, to increase their own security uh, that uh, they should feel free to do that. And uh, who did you tell them were the potentially, <clears throat> excuse me, dangerous patients? I didn't tell them. And what did you tell them the potentially dangerous patients looked like? Didn't tell them. So you didn't tell them anything that would let them protect themselves if these potentially dangerous persons showed up, did you? No, what I specifically told them was that um, uh, if they felt that there was some need for them to take any special um, measures to protect the offices more or protect themselves more, that they should uh, feel free to do that and um, that in my view that the situation was uh, extremely dangerous and they should do whatever they thought was necessary to protect their security in relationship to the office. Did they do anything different? I don't know. I didn't ask them. And did they ask you, well, how dangerous? What are we talking about here? Yes, they did. And did you tell them? Yes, I said it was very dangerous. Well, did you tell them I'm talking murder here? I don't think I said any words to that effect. You I didn't don't. tell them that what you were talking about was that a patient had confessed what you have described as murder to you, did you? I don't really recall whether I did or I didn't. I, I know that they definitely got the, uh, I mean, from, from their response. Your Honor, uh, I'm going to object to their response. Sustained. Now, did you, um, after October 31st, were there ever occasions when because of your fear, you sought to have yourself escorted to the parking lot? Um, there may have been one occasion. Uh, I don't uh, recall having had that happen more than um, once. Do you know when that would have been? Uh, I don't recall whether it was on November 2nd or whether it was October 31st, but it was one of one those One of those days. two days? Yes, it was. But you didn't do that after those two days? I don't recall it. Um, let me get back for a moment to the purchase of shotguns. Uh, was there some reason, well, strike that, 
Before you went to purchase the shotguns, had you and your wife decided it was going to be shotguns or was it just going to be guns? No, we decided that it was going to be shotguns. And why did you decide that? Um, we decided... Uh, let, let me, rather than ask you that open a question, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> <coughs> I do that, yes. and you may ask another <clears throat> question. Let me withdraw that question. Did you consider any other kind of guns before you decided shotguns? Uh, yes. Okay. What other kinds of guns did you consider? Pistols. And was there some reason why you didn't purchase pistols and you purchased shotguns? Yes. And was that the two-week waiting period under California law? Well. No, well, partially. I have to. I, I can answer that question this way. No, no. Let, let's no, it's partially correct, and uh, so the answer is yes. And is that acceptable, Your Honor? Yes and no. Well, it's yes and yes, partial. <laughs> yes and no. All right. Um, you know, these are all areas that, um, if uh, other counsel want to go go into, they can do that. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you also <clears throat> fear that shotguns had greater firepower than pistols? I'm sorry, did I fear it? No, did you feel, oh, I'm sorry, feel, it? feel um, that shotgun, did that enter into the equation? No, no, I don't know that much about shotguns. Did you ever practice with the shotguns that you bought that day to see if you could actually get it to go boom? Uh, no, I did not. And where did you keep it once you had it in your home? Different places. Did you move it around on purpose based on your assessment of threat or fear? Um, from time to time, I did move the shotguns. <clears throat> Let me talk to you for a moment, Dr. Ozil, before we turn to the sessions themselves about your billing practices to the extent you are familiar with them. With respect to um, your regular patients, you hold appointment time for them from week to week, is that right? Um, yes. And if a regular patient is going to be unavailable for an appointment, they're supposed to let you know that in order to avoid being billed for the time, a certain amount of time before the appointment, is that right? Well, actually, any patient um, who makes an appointment and who doesn't give me enough notice is billed for the time if they cancel the appointment or don't show up for the appointment. What's enough notice? Um, it's just uh, enough notice uh, such that I could fill the time or, or enough notice. It's a minimum of 24 hours. Okay, let's get to this. The minimum notice is 24 hours, so it's got to be 24 hours or better, right? Um, yes. And if a patient were to call 24 hours in advance and say, I just broke my leg, I can't make it, and you couldn't find anybody else to fill the space, would you bill them anyway? Uh, no. The billing policy is such that if, uh, if someone has a literal emergency, you know, an illness or their car breaks down on the freeway or, or whatever it is, um, then the agreement with the, the patient at the beginning of therapy is that uh, they, they wouldn't be billed for emergencies. And they also uh, uh, wouldn't be billed for a certain number of vacations with adequate notice that they take. And other than that, they're normally responsible for all sessions, which is standard therapeutic practice to bill people in that way. Let's go back. Let's say they, um, they call you the morning of the appointment so we don't have 24 hours and they broke their leg. Is there an emergency exception even if it's within the 24 hours? Uh, ordinarily, there, there would be. There is okay. supposed to be. What if uh, someone calls you 24 hours in advance and says, I don't feel like it this week. Okay? That's not an emergency, is it? No, it isn't. That's avoiding therapy, right? I would just not categorize it as an emergency. Right. And so would you bill that person? Ordinarily. If you filled the spot with another patient, would you bill them both? Um, if, in fact, they had a regular time, or I was reserving a time for them on my schedule, yes, I would bill the, the person and then offer them a makeup, which is my uh, normal practice. But if they either couldn't or didn't make up, they would pay for the time and the patient who was substituted in would pay for the time too. 
If the time was filled, that would be correct, but the person who would be substituted in would ordinarily be somebody else who was in my schedule who had missed a time who I was offering a makeup time to. Either that or maybe there's a new patient on the horizon, somebody who never had a session with you before and you could fill that person in, right? Yeah. That happens too. Uh, very, very rarely. The reality is that um, I had a, a waiting list and often have a waiting list of people that I can't accept as a new patient unless I have a regular open time to see them because virtually all people in my practice in fact, almost everyone in my practice has a regular weekly time that they see me, which is the standard in psychotherapy. So you can't take somebody off a waiting list and just, you know, plug them into a, a gap in the schedule and uh, then next week say, I know I saw you last week and uh, for a consultation, but I don't have any time to see you anymore. I, that was just plugging in an open time. So that's really not considered proper and I don't, it's not what I do. There's a fair number of cancellations and no-shows in any given week on your schedule, are there not? Um, Injection bank is a fair number, and also as to time. Overall, just in general. Uh, there, are, I don't think there's a fair number. There are some. And are you saying that what you do is you just juggle <laughs> patients who had other slots and missed appointments and to fill in those spaces when people cancel or don't show? Uh, I try to, or the office is instructed to do that. Now, if people just flat out don't show without giving you uh, any notice, you obviously charge them for the time. That's correct. Let's uh, turn to October 31st, and because of the way the evidence has been presented, I'm going to uh, first question you about things that occurred when both Eric and Lyle were there together, okay? Did you want me to take out my transcript? Yeah, why not? Okay. have it. <clears throat> I don't want you to read it just yet. Unless okay. I just want to set the stage. Uh, you were alone with Eric in your office <coughs> when you made this call to Lyle. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, did you make the call from a telephone in the consultation room? Yes, I did. And was Eric present when you, make, when you made the call? Yes, he was. And when you uh, made the call, did you call the home on Elm Drive? Best of my recollection, I did. And uh, did Lyle answer the phone? I don't remember whether Lyle answered the phone or somebody else answered the phone, but I did talk with Lyle. Did he sound surprised to hear from you? I don't recall his initial response when had, I... Had you ever talked to Lyle on the telephone before? Don't recall whether I had or hadn't. Now, you didn't tell Lyle anything on the telephone about, uh, factually, about your conversation with Eric up until that point. Is that correct? Mm, I, I don't know what you mean by factually. You didn't relay to Lyle any specific fact or facts that Eric had told you. Isn't uh, that true? Well, I did say well, that Don't tell us what you say. If you cannot answer the question, say you cannot answer the question, okay? I cannot answer the question. All right. You understand, Dr. Ozeal, we've had you testify in front of three different configurations of the jury. One jury, another jury. All right, counsel, jurors. let's uh, ask questions, and if uh, there's any need to instruct the witness, uh, you can request the court to do it. Okay, would the court instruct the witness then not to volunteer any kind of hearsay information unless it's called for in the question? All right, just ask the question, and uh, we'll deal with it as the questions are being asked. Now, when Lyle, um, but how long a period of time elapsed between your calling Lyle and his getting to the office? Um, approximately 10 to 15 minutes, best of my recollection. <coughs> and without relaying any conversation during those 10 to 15 minutes, were you and Eric talking or were you and Eric silent? Oh, we were talking.
and were you talking behind the closed door of this consultation room down the long corridor of the L that you have previously described to the jury? That's to my recollection we were. And uh, the door was closed to that room, correct? Yes, it was. Was it locked? Uh, I don't recall whether the, are you talking about the door? To the consultation room. The actual door to the consultation room. I don't recall if the actual door to the consultation room was locked. And so you and Eric are in there talking for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, how did you know Lyle was there when he got there? Um, when Lyle got there, um, uh, I asked Eric to watch for the light because the, uh, actually the patient's chair, it's not, it's not, wasn't a very well constructed office. The patient's chair is situated such that when a patient comes in, the patient presses a button that turns on a light in the office. But the light that it turns on in the office is actually behind the chair that, that I um, formerly sat in, in that office. So I asked uh, Eric to notify me when the light went on. And so when the light went on, I uh, went out and um, opened the door for Lyle, and Lyle came in. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find So a light went on. That's how you knew Lyle was there. Is that right? Uh, Eric told me the light went on, yes. OK, and did you look and verify light was on? N yes. And that's a signal. People come in the waiting room to let you know they're there. They punch something, and the light goes on. Mm, that's correct. So you left the office? Well, I went to the office and opened the door for Lyle to come in, yes. Which door did you open for Lyle to come in? I had to open two doors. Right, One so you door. left the consultation room office? Yes, I left the consultation room office to let Lyle in. And you had to go to the door that led from the waiting room, is that right? That's correct. And uh, did you wait any measurable period of time after Eric told you the light went on before you went to get Lyle? I don't recall having waited any uh, measurable length of time. And then you got Lyle, and he walked down those long corridors and back into that consultation room with you. Is that right? That's correct. And did you close that door leading to the waiting room after you met with Lyle? Yes, I did. Were you expecting any other patients that night? Uh, no, I wasn't. What time was it? Uh, I don't recall the time. And you got back into the consultation room and you closed that door, is that right? That's correct. How old was Lyle Menendez at that time? How old was Lyle Menendez at that time? Uh, if you know. I don't know. How old was Eric? I don't know. How far had uh, Eric gone in his education as of October 1989? I believe that he was in high school, but I don't. Uh, I think that he was in his senior year at high school. Would you uh, characterize yourself, Dr. Ozeal, as an articulate person? I don't think that I would characterize myself um, in any particular way at all. Well, if I were to ask you, are you articulate? You'd say. That's presumptuous on my part, and I wouldn't uh, respond to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so you're not articulate. Excuse me, Anna, could we um, start counsel's gratuitous comments? Yes, let's just ask questions and not make uh, editorial comment, please. Are you comfortable in using the English language? Yes, I feel comfortable using the English language. Do you think you have an extensive vocabulary? I think I have a serviceable vocabulary, yes. Do you think you had, as of October 1989, a more extensive vocabulary than Eric Menendez, a senior in high school? Probably. <clears throat> now, we have established, haven't we, Dr. Ozeal, that at the time you dictated the tape from which those notes were transcribed, whether that was one week or two weeks later, you had absolutely nothing in writing to refresh your memory of what was said. True? To the best of my recollection, that's true. 
And I have looked over, in looking over, strike that, Your Honor, in looking over that transcript, isn't it also true that it does not purport to be direct quotes from either Eric or Lyle or you? As to which session are you talking about? October 31st? October 31st. I'm looking at the uh, transcript. <coughs> Uh, the entire transcript is not represented as uh, a verbatim quotation. Um, however, uh, much of what is in the transcript was my best attempt to um, specify exactly what was said to me. All right. Look, there's two things here, are there not? Number one, it doesn't purport to be <coughs> verbatim the words that either Eric or Lyle used in talking, correct? That's incorrect. Purport means representing itself to be. It doesn't represent itself to be verbatim, does it? Um, but you just said that. It's not verbatim. A lot of the sentences are verbatim. Some of them are not verbatim. Most uh, of them are not in quotes, correct? It is correct that most of the statements um, don't have quotation marks around them. Thank you. Now, is it your testimony that most of what's in this transcript is in the exact words that Eric and Lyle used. Why don't you rephrase the question, please? Okay. Are most of the words that are represented here for the October 31st session the identical and exact words that Eric and Lyle used? Um, most of the statements attributed to Eric and Lyle are as close as possible to being the exact words that Eric and Lyle used in my recollection. Is that no? They're not the exact words, they're just as close as possible? Vague. Overall. Uh, no. It's Is that yes, they well, are counsel, the exact words? Counsel, let him finish words? the answer. He was in the process of responding. A significant percentage of the uh, statements attributed to Eric and Lyle um, are as near as possible my exact recollection uh, as to what they said. And um, I can't uh, represent that every single word that, uh, that I recalled is exactly correct and that I have a perfect memory and that uh, there were no errors whatsoever in my memory, but when I dictated these notes, it was with the intention of recreating what Eric and Lyle said to me as exactly and as verbatim as I could, except in instances where I was uh, discussing my own perceptions and my own observations or opinions and conclusions which were not intended to be representations of verbatim quotes from Eric and Lyle. You understand, Dr. Azeel, that in this trial, both of these juries have either already heard or... Counsel, again, let's ask a question in an uh, appropriate fashion here. Is any of the statements that you uh, attribute, let's start with Eric, in Eric's vocabulary and syntaxical style, is that what you're saying? That they are? The yes, I'm, Eric saying, talk? I'm saying some of them are. You're saying most of them are, is that true? Well, in order to do that, uh, Ms. Abramson, what I'd have to do is go through every single statement in this transcript and, uh, and assess um, you know, exactly what percentage were and were not uh, verbatim. Well, let's go to this one. Turn to page three. First paragraph in page three. Let me just consult. Uh, skip ahead to page 10. Now look at the last paragraph on page 10. Which conversation are we referring to and which session are we referring to then? Well, we're trying to talk about syntax, Your Honor. Page 10 refers to November 2nd. Is that, well, let's ask the witness that. Uh, you're not the witness. True. Ask the witness. Page 10 refers to November 2nd, doesn't it?
page 10 appears to refer to November 2nd. Now look at the last paragraph on page 10 and let's start with this question. You already testified to this information. What that paragraph purports to say is um, how Eric and Lyle felt about their father and why they felt they had to kill him. True? Um, I'm not sure where you're reading from. The last paragraph yes. on page mm -hmm. 10. Yes? Okay. Yes. And then it goes on to page 11, the rest of that paragraph, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, isn't that paragraph on page 10 where you wrote or you dictated they had always known that they had hated their father and that they had felt that they had to kill him due to the fact that he totally controlled them, made them feel inadequate and inferior, dominated them, and preached a higher moral level at the same time that he talked about other people, etc., etc. Now, haven't you previously testified that was a summary of different things that each of the boys said over the course of a measurable period of time? in talking about their father. With that particular statement, yes, that's correct. And it is a summary put in your words, is it not? I didn't state that. Well, I'm asking you, did uh, Eric sit there and say, my father made me feel inadequate and inferior? Is that what he said? I think I testified that Eric did use the words inadequate or inferior um, well, at points during the session. I'm not stating, and I didn't testify, that he strung together all of those words in one sentence as a summary, and I think I've testified that was my summary of what he said. So you strung the words together, is that correct? That's correct. And isn't that true in more than just that one place in the portions of the transcript that you've testified to? Uh, that in many places in this transcript you are summarizing, stringing the words together. Well, I wouldn't characterize it as stringing the words together. What I'm summarizing are the things that Eric and Lyle told me um, over a very long period of time, a period of time that I believe was four and a half hours. And um, uh, some of these uh, paragraphs or some of these uh, uh, statements are, in fact, summaries of the things that they said in the course of a much longer period of time, maybe five or ten minutes. And uh, so I, absolutely, there, there are other sentences that are summaries of things that they stated to me. So let's say there was a 20-minute discussion. You would write a summary in which you would take what you believe to be the salient features of that or the important points about that, and you'd string together these words to describe what you thought the theme was or the main features. Isn't that what you did for some of the stuff in here? Uh, it's correct. For some of the, of the statements here, um, that's what occurred. Now, what efforts did you make to check? As you're hearing from them, what efforts did you make to check, if anything, any of the facts that they were giving you. Um, I don't understand what you mean by that. Well, let me focus you, for example. You have testified that on November 2nd, when uh, both of our clients were present, that there was a lengthy discussion about their mother and how miserable she was, and what a victim she was, and how suicidal she was. Those things. Remember that? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Did you, now, you knew Mrs. Menendez, correct? That's correct. Had she ever told you she was miserable, suicidal, and depressed? Correction calls from your side. Sustained. Did you make any effort whatsoever after November 2nd to verify whether, based on what Lyle and Eric were telling you, Kitty Menendez in fact had been suicidal, miserable, depressed? Overall. Um, no, I didn't at that point uh, investigate uh, whether 
she was miserable, depressed, and suicidal. Did you investigate it at any subsequent point? Um, I didn't investigate it, but I did. Then you've answered the question. Okay. As a matter of common practice, if a patient says to you, I broke my leg when I was seven and it ruined my life, would you try, or words to something like that, this happened to me and I think it had a very big effect. Do you make any effort to check to see if they're telling you the truth? Uh, Sustain. Well, I'd like to be heard on that. Why don't you go on to something else? Now you've testified that after Lyle arrived, he was upset and he made a statement that now that you knew, it wasn't a perfect murder anymore. Do you remember that testimony? Uh, yes. Now you also testified that before Lyle arrived, Eric told you it was a perfect murder, didn't you? I believe so. I want you to look at the notes for October 31st for that portion before Lyle arrives, which by the way, Lyle arrives at page six, and find in those notes Eric's statement that it was a perfect murder. Uh, Ms. Abramson, I think I testified. Just, could you just look and see if it's there? Um, You're asking about prior to the arrival of Lyle Menendez? Indeed, Your Honor. I, I don't think that the actual uh, transcription uh, shows the word perfect in relationship to uh, Eric having said it uh, prior to uh, Lyle's arrival. And All right, now, my question then is, it does not appear in the notes, does it? It doesn't appear in these notes. Okay. Now, however, isn't it true that before you called Lyle, now, isn't it true, Dr. Ozeal, that in fact what happened was, after Eric had spoken to you, you concluded that, in your mind, the Menendez brothers had a perfect situation where no one would discover them. And in your ruminations, you thought the only weakness would be if someone knew information. Wasn't that your internal thought process at that point, before you called Lyle? No, it wasn't. Calling court and counsel's attention to the in-camera transcript, June 15, 1990, page 36. And I propose to read from line 21. What page? Page? 36, Your Honor. Actually, I, re I propose to read from line 23. Well, let me approach and tell the court what I want to do before I start doing it and someone objects. Oh, wait a second. All right, counsel, you may approach. All right, we'll resume at 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We will resume at 1.30. In the trial, the defendants and all counsel and both juries are present, and we'll resume with the examination of the witness. Uh, Dr. Ozeal, you may continue the cross-examination. Dr. Ozeal, would you turn to um, page 10 of your notes? 
Now, uh, we were talking uh, this morning about this paragraph here, which is this summary <coughs> of um, these uh, reasons that uh, you indicate uh, Lyle and Eric gave you for killing their father. He totally controlled them, made them feel inadequate and inferior, dominated them. Correct? Uh, that's correct. All right. Now, uh, did they, in the course of this session on November 2nd, or in the course of the previous session when they were together on October 31st, give you any examples of how their father controlled or dominated or did these things when they were little? Um, I'm trying to recall. Well, let's start with a preliminary question. There's no examples in these notes of the way their father treated them when they were little kids in, in this document in front of you, is there? I don't recall that there is any. And do you recall it even coming up in the course of this discussion that you say you've memorialized here on either October 31st or November 2nd? Uh, no. If, if the question you're asking, well, can you repeat the question? Did either Lyle or Eric on either November 2nd when they were together or October 31st when they were together give you any examples of how their father totally controlled them, made them feel inadequate and inferior, and dom dominated them and preached a higher moral level that referred to when they were little children. Can you define little children? Under 12. I don't recall them having talked about what happened when they were under 12. Now, they told you, well, let me ask you this. You testified, I think, uh, in effect, that the boys were confused by their father. That's correct. They were confused about whether he was a moral person or an immoral person. Was that what you're talking about here? Um, I think that they simply said that their father was a confusing man. And uh, I think that uh, when I asked them, um, well, that they said that they saw him as being predominantly moral and didn't know of any behavior that he had taken that was that was immoral. We had a, a discussion. Well, before about, you go on, yes. before that, there was a previous discussion. Um, weren't you told that their father had said to them that if uh, if he had been in charge of China when the Chinese rebelled, what he would have done, and this was in reference to Tiananmen uh, Square. What he would have done was to have lied to all the people, get them all under his control, and then kill them all. That's correct. Now, that sounded very immoral to you, did it not? To me, it sounded outrageously immoral. And it seemed very immoral to Eric and Lyle as well, did it not, to sucker these people and mow them all down? You know, uh, I don't know what Eric and Lyle were feeling except they gave that as an example to me of, of uh, their father's uh, system of operation. Uh, they didn't okay. characterize it as being immoral, but it certainly seemed to me to be outrageously immoral. Well, didn't it come at the end of this discussion where he made them feel inadequate and inferior, dominated them, and preached a higher moral level? This is what he preached, while at the same time, he talked about other people as if they were sheep, and he talked about what he would have done if he was in China in charge of the rebellion in Tiananmen Square. Well, l let me answer it uh, this well, way. Well, is that what's written here? I'm actually trying to clarify in a positive sense what was, what was happening. Is that what's written here? Well, uh, Council, you asked a uh, lengthy question. Are you asking specifically uh, the words that are on the page or uh, something beyond that. Well, right now I'm just trying to authenticate, Your Honor. Well, why don't you just read the, the words then? I just did. It, are those the exact words that uh, are on the page? Is that what well, you're asking? Well, I can him? read them all over again and get the exact words. Uh, uh, maybe I can respond to the question. You can. Why don't we withdraw the question? We'll start all over again. 
Okay, we'll start with, they had always known that they had hated their father and that they had felt that they had to kill him due to the fact that he totally controlled them, made them feel inadequate and inferior, dominated them, and preached a higher moral level at the same time that he talked about other people as being sheep and them as being the shepherds, and also talked about the notion that if the Chinese had rebelled under him in China, that what he would have done was to lie to them, appease them, get them all under his control, and then kill them all. Now, is that what's written here? Absolutely. And therefore, the way this is written, uh, the inference is, is it not that these behaviors, preaching, talking about other people being sheep, and what he would have done in China, is at odds with Mr. Menendez is preaching a higher moral level. It, it certainly is written that way, and I believe that the context in which it was spoken by Eric and Lyle was to contrast um, confusing messages from their father. All I was meaning to state is that I don't recall them as having specifically uh, uh, characterized it with words as saying that it was immoral, but I do believe that that's the inference. Okay, that was an example they were giving you from their current life of how morally confusing he was, correct? I, I think it was. Now, was there any discussion during these two sessions when the two brothers were together about how their mother would in any way soften or ameliorate or lessen the damage that this controlling, dominating, belittling father did. Is there any discussion here at all about what mom did for them? Mm, uh, no, there were specific discussions, but not about what mom did for them to soften anything. Were there any discussions or any mention by either one of them when they're talking about how harsh and domineering their father was about how their mother would comfort them? No, I don't believe so. In talking about their mother, based on what's in these notes, it appears that the only person, um, we'll strike that, it appears that the only relationship in the family that they talk about with the mother is the mother's relationship with the father. Is that correct? No, I wouldn't say that. Well, they talk, do they not, about the mother being the father's victim, correct? Yes. And as far as Eric is concerned, that's the only discussion you've ascribed to him, that the mother was the father's victim, correct? I don't, I don't recall um, if that's the only <coughs> description that I ascribe to him uh, in these uh, transcribed notes. Um, there is no actual, in these notes, there is no mention uh, by Eric um, of any criticism of his mother at all. There may not be. I, I just don't know. Now, you said that each of them talked about writing a book about their father. Is that right? That's correct. And your, I guess, sense was that it was going to be an extremely praiseworthy book, right? It wasn't my sense. It was their statement. They said their it's statements. going to be an extremely praiseworthy book? No. These two said that? I didn't say that. Okay. Well... They said they were going to write a book. That's correct. You characterized that the tone of that book would be extremely praiseworthy, correct? I think, I think uh, yes, I did. And that's based on uh, whatever it was they actually said to you, the sense that you got was extremely praiseworthy, correct? That's correct. Now, was it supposed to be a novel? Um, I don't think it was supposed to be a novel. It's not the did you think that if it was, I'm sorry. No, I just, that's not the recollection that I have. Well, I, I recollect that uh, well, I recollect that Ms. Bizanich asked you a question at 9388, line 23. 
volume 61. Ninety-three eighty-eight, starting with your question at page tw uh, line twenty-three. Do you recall Miss Bazanicha saying to you Wednesday? Now, did they indicate to you at that point one of the reasons, in light of this novel that they wanted to write, one of the reasons they had killed him? Do you remember her asking you if it was a novel? I, I didn't listen that carefully to the word novel. Okay. Uh, did you think that if they were going to write an extremely praiseworthy book about their father, that if it were not a novel, it would still have to be fictional for it to be extremely praiseworthy? I can't state that. Sustain. The answer is stricken. If there now, was. you've indicated that <coughs> you've indicated that um, on more than one occasion in the course of these two sessions when the boys were together, uh, they talked about their father in terms that led you to believe they were in awe of him, correct? That's correct. They admired him, didn't they? Yes, they did. They thought he was greatly accomplished, didn't they? They did. Very successful. They did. And did you discern from that 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 was a message in their family, that what their father was, was what one should be? I, Sustain. You knew Mr. Menendez, didn't you? I did. And he wasn't your patient, was he? He was not. And you had how many meetings with him? I don't recall, but um, it was more than one. Let me ask you this question, Dr. Ozeal. Did you like him? Mm, no. Overall, what was your answer? No. Did he treat you respectfully? Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know about that, but that has nothing to do with why I didn't like him. Uh, I didn't ask you that. I just asked you the first half. Did he treat you respectfully? Uh, I, don't, I don't think he particularly treated me respectfully or anybody respectfully. Was he condescending towards you? Uh, yes, he was condescending. Now, you understand I'm not asking you for expert opinion, just as a person meeting another person. I understand. Did he appear to be a very strong-willed person? Um, lack of foundation. Do we have some foundation here? Yes, uh, objection sustained. Well, you've already testified you met him. You think more than once. Well, I'm, I'm uh, a little concerned about privilege issues. Yes, it does seem that uh, you're asking for more than just what might be derived from meetings with right. Mr. Menendez. All right, I will ask it differently. Uh, did he dominate the conversation when you were in his presence? Yes, and lack of foundation. Overruled. Yes, he did. Now, You also met Mrs. Menendez, didn't you? I did. And do you recall on how many occasions you met her? Again, uh, several times. And when you saw her, did she seem sad? Mm, uh, she seemed sad. Now, I'm not asking for a clinical impression here. Did she seem sad? She seemed sad and a lot of other uh, adjectives that I'd uh, ascribe as well. Not, not only sad, that's just one small component. Did she seem depressed? I would say she seemed depressed. <coughs> so 
just step out of this for a moment, Dr. Ozeal. To the best of your knowledge as a therapist, is there any negative impact on children who are being raised by a depressed mother? Yeah, I, we have Jack at this point uh, beyond the scope of direct and Objection sustained on the first ground. Well, I'd like to be heard. Sure. To page um, 11, Dr. Ozeal. When you testified here, You were being asked questions uh, by Mrs. Bozanich uh, in direct, and uh, you testified here concerning, let's get to a general question, uh, the explanation about why uh, Mrs. Menendez was killed. And 93-91 uh, counsel, you said, you, you looked down at your notes and then you testified at line 21. They felt it was a plan that wouldn't allow for any detection of it. Would you be good enough, Dr. Ozeal, to look on page 11 and point out for me that phrase, wouldn't allow for any detection, or the word detection at all on that page or any other page? Uh, I'm quite certain that, uh, that that word is not in the transcript and uh, I don't contend that uh, all the words that were used or the entire content of those two sessions are in this transcript. I think I've testified to the contrary. Now on, you also testified You also testified at page 9399, line 5. You said that they really didn't kill their parents for money, but out of the hatred that they had in particular towards your father. Now I call your attention to page 14. You meant towards their father? I'm sorry. I think you misread it. You said your father. Their father, I said. It's a, the mic is fuzzy today. Are you looking at 14? Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, didn't hear 14. <clears throat> I am now. Okay. Now, in these notes, what you wrote in the last paragraph of 14 was, the boys were making the point that they didn't kill their parents for money, but rather out of hatred, etc. Now, do you see any distinction between the way you testified? They really didn't kill their parents for their money versus what's in the notes. They were making the point they didn't kill their parents for the money. Or is it all the same to you? Objection Why don't you read back the testimony that you're referring to, uh, the exact quote. They really didn't kill their parents for money, but out of the hatred that they had, in particular towards their father. I, I don't know the distinction that you're making. All right, so to you, that it doesn't make any difference whether you say really didn't. Who suggested that they did? Um, they discussed the role that money played in the killing, and so they said it played no role in the killing. Correct? N no, that's not correct. Not correct. You want to change your testimony? No, I'm not changing my testimony. Okay. Show me where they said that money played any role in the killing. Ms. Abramson, I think I've made the point. Uh, repeatedly that uh, this transcript does not consist of the totality of all the things that were so said. So you left me. that part out, Dr. Azul? You forgot that? Excuse me, may we take a All right, number one, uh, it's unclear what you're referring to about, about that part. So um, until you clarify that, we have a cross-examination or questioning well. about a subject that is uh, 
rather I'll be happy. I'll be happy to clear it up. Are you saying, Dr. Ozeal, that they told you that money played a part in the killing? Is that what you're now testifying to? Uh, no, actually, I'm, if you want me to clarify what I'm saying, just I'll be glad answer, to. If you could just answer the question, this would move a lot faster. Excuse me, Your Honor, could that yes. Be Counsel, again, if you have something to say to the witness, um, address it to me and I'll are you deal with it. I'm sorry. Are you saying that or no? I don't even know what you're asking me at this point, Counsel. Okay. I'm asking you, I'm asking you, did they say that money played any part in the killing? I don't think I can lump Eric and Lyle together and answer that question. It's not possible. Then I will ask you about Eric. Did Eric ever indicate that money played any part at all in the killing? Excuse me. Yes. 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 All right. Number six, because you thought about it in advance, correct? That's correct. Now, you testified here, if I can pair these things. Concerning one pattern of killing, I believe you said, you testified here in front of the uh, juries uh, that one pattern of killing, this is 93-99 counsel at page 17, that you had described to Eric and Lyle had certain characteristics. And these are the ones you gave. It had to do with being premeditated, involving sort of a plan, a job that needed to be accomplished, where the killing was, in fact, something that was like a job that had to get done, get accomplished, that feelings were, there either weren't many feelings about it, or whatever feelings that there were really didn't get in the way. Do you recall your testimony of that effect on Wednesday? Yes, I do. And is that word for word what you uh, told Eric and Lyle uh, during the meeting that you had with them on November 2nd to describe this particular kind of killing? It's the best um, reproduction that I can produce uh, four years later of what I said. Uh, I can't uh, swear that it absolutely was word for word. It's the best of my memory. All right. Well, then let's call your attention to the testimony you gave at a hearing out of the jury's presence on Friday, July 30th. And this is um, Mrs. Bazanich six pages into his testimony. I have the unofficial version. And do you recall testifying? Just a moment. Um, Sorry. Do you have the short one? Yeah, but if it's the short one, it's page six. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Here, and I'm going to start reading here. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, is that the same one? No. I'll find it for you in that one. It's just six pages in from the beginning of this testimony. Okay. Okay. On July 30th, 1993, do you recall testifying as follows concerning that first type of murder? A murder that was predominantly a means to an end something that the murderer believed was a way to achieve a particular end. It was a planned, premeditated murder and a way to deal with problem solving and that if there were emotions involved with it, they didn't get in the way of needing to accomplish the end and that once there was a decision that the murder had to be committed, it was committed and feelings basically didn't enter into it in a significant way. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, I do. So when you testified in trial, you talked about a job that had to get done. That's sort of like your hitman patient, is it not? Um, that's similar to that uh, person. As compared to what you testified to on July 30th, a problem-solving thing. Do you see those two as indistinguishable? Uh, not 
Not really. In my mind, they're not uh, distinguishable. They're not distinguishable I, I met in your mind. Fundamentally, the same thing. Let me ask you this. Well, let, let me move on to your second description. Before the juries. And that's at 9,400. You said that what you told Eric and Lyle was there was another kind of killing. Uh, you testified the other kind of killing that I described was a killing, if you will, out of intense emotion. Something that occurred, a crime of passion type of killing, where there wasn't any premeditation and it wasn't a logical, rational plan to murder someone. It was just coming in, for example, to find something very emotional happening in one's life and grabbing the nearest knife or pistol and in the heat of the moment shooting someone. So a lack of premeditation and something arising primarily out of emotion, not out of thought and rational and plan and logic. Remember that testimony? Yes. Oh, you're refreshing my memory, right? Now, uh, do you recall testifying on July 30th, last Friday, about how you described this other kind of murder? Uh, it's again on page six, counsel. I, I'm sorry, I don't have that transcript. Well, it's on page, the sixth page of the official. No, no. Do you want me to find it for you? Mm -hmm. Welcome. And uh, the way you testified about this crime of passion on July 30th was, I gave an example such as someone coming home to find their partner or spouse in bed with someone else, or something of that nature, and then picking up a knife or a gun and killing them and that that is someone acting out of emotion and without a rational plan was eventually, maybe the word should have been essential, right? huh? eventually committing an act of passion. It wasn't something that was premeditated. Recall that testimony. It sounds uh, like the testimony I gave. All right. And you don't see any, that there's any difference or distinction in the two different ways that you describe this kind of murder as between the the hearing and the testimony in trial. Is that right? They seem similar to me in terms of what I was uh, communicating. I'm not saying that the words are identical. I'm just saying that the, uh, uh, that the concepts are similar to me. All right, let me, let me ask you about similar concepts. What if you had the following situation? Which one of your two kinds of murder would it fit? Let's assume that you're a homeowner, hypothetically. That there's a homeowner living in an area that has been subjected to many violent burglaries, burglars coming in and hurting people, okay? So this homeowner decides he's got to do something to protect his family. So he plans to go out and buy some shotguns in order to protect his family. And he acts upon that plan and he goes out and he buys some shotguns and he goes home. And he expects, because these burglaries have been happening in a pattern, that a burglar may indeed break into his house. And he's sitting up at night, and he has the shotgun across his knees. And a burglar starts breaking into his house. And he isn't emotional, but he shoots the burglar. Which category does that fall into? Your Honor, we would object to this as being improper opinion of evidence and improper evidence. Objection sustained. Well, I, I, uh, Assume, Dr. Ozeal, that when you gave the Menendez brothers these two exceptions, um, you gave them this choice, choose A or choose B. Excuse Is that right? May we please approach? Yes. Your next question, please. Now, Dr. Ozeal, you testified that after describing, with whatever specific words you may have done it at the time, these two different kinds of murders, uh, Eric and Lyle indicated which one was more, more appropriately or approximately described their situation. Is that right? They just identified a, uh, which, okay. which category. Okay. Uh, they didn't ask you any questions about defining the terms, did they? They did not. 
And they didn't ask you if you had used, for example, the problem solving example. They didn't ask you what you meant by what do you mean by problem or what do you mean by problem solving. They didn't ask anything, did they? Uh, no, they didn't. Were you in 1989 familiar with the literature on parasite? No, I was not. Were you uh, familiar with the literature on adolescent homicide? Your Honor, uh, this is, we would object as being the young director. Well, as far as the questions whether he was familiar with it, without going beyond that, the objections overruled. Okay, I'm not going to go into the literature, but. Were you familiar with the literature of adolescent, the studies on adolescent homicide? No, I was not. And you understood when I used the word parasite, I meant parent killing by children? Yes, I did. Now, you testified that there was a discussion On November the 2nd, in fact, you testified that throughout the discussions on November 2nd, both Lyle and Eric commented on how perfect the appearance of their family was to the outside world. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Now, did you meet some of the members of the family after the parents died? Yes, I did. And I think you've indicated you spent some substantial period of time around Eric and Lyle and family members over the course of three days. That's correct. And were you, did you ever hear, while in close proximity to Eric and Lyle, did you ever hear other members of the family at this point talking about the parents in very glowing terms? Objection calls for hearsay. Sustained. It's not being offered for the truth, Your Honor. Objection is sustained. Now, in the course of this session on November 2nd, um, did Eric and Lyle continue to talk about the family, in spite of what happened, as being a successful family? Uh, they seemed very confused. They spoke about it as being a successful family, and they spoke about it as being a sham of a family. So I'd say that they were they made both sets of statements. You indicate that either one or both or some amalgamation of them both said that the father had no relationship except a negative one and an abusive one with the mother and that the boys had total distance and criticism and rejection and humiliation from the father, right? Sounds right. And nowhere is there any description of what the mother's relationship towards, for example, Eric was at all. In that description? No, there isn't in that description. In the whole session? There isn't in these notes. Question, and nowhere was there any description of what the mother's relationship towards, for example, Eric was at all in that description? Yes, I, I think it would be accurate to say that, um, that that description did not have anything to do with Eric's relationship with his uh, mother. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear... I didn't understand that last answer. All right, we'll have the answer in back. Yes, thank you. No, I don't think that's the question I asked you, though. I, I asked you, did you get any description over the course of either session uh, from Eric about his relationship with his mother? In the notes? Well, and, well, I'm only asking about what I know about. I only know it's in the notes. Counsel, again, let's not uh, make statements such as that. The your comment is stricken, 
and re-ask the question, please. In the notes. No. Now, is it your, are you prepared to say that there were discussions about his relationship with his mother on October 31st and November 2nd, but you just didn't put it in the notes? Is, uh, is that your position? Yes. Did she make any uh, rational decision or logical decision as to what to put in and what to leave out, or is it just whatever you remembered on the day you dictated? I think that uh, what I tended to do in, in uh, dictating these notes was to dictate um, what the essential elements of these sessions were to the best of my recollection and as faithfully as possible. And I, I wasn't at the time um, understanding or thinking that these uh, notes would ever be uh, used for any particular purpose and I certainly didn't ever construe the dictated notes to be a complete restatement of every single interaction that occurred in the seven or eight hours worth of sessions that I had with Eric and Lyle and I, I and they are not a complete restatement of the entire um, uh, eight hours of sessions that I had on those two dates with Eric and Lyle. Well, you've already testified that you did make these notes for a particular purpose, and that was a purpose to, I think you've told us, protect you. Isn't that why you made these notes? Put them on tape? Put them in a safe deposit box? I think my testimony was that uh, that was one of a number of reasons why I made the notes. Well, let's, let's stick with that reason for a moment, if we can. Now, it is your position here that you were threatened on the night of October 31st, and as a result of that threat, you told a woman that you have characterized as not very stable about this confession of murder. Are we, am I stating your testimony accurately so far? That part of it. Okay. Now, you talked to us a little bit before in the, your testimony about Evidence Code Section 1024. And Evidence Code Section 1024 says that if a psychotherapist, for example, has reason to believe and does believe that a patient poses a threat to another party, then the privilege may not apply to some of the information that the therapist has received from a patient. Generally speaking, that's what it says, right? Generally speaking. All right, and you interpreted on October 31st, section 1024, to mean that since you had been threatened and since you conceived that Ms. Smith was also potentially in danger, you had a right to unprivilege, basically, the information that you had received from Eric and Lyle, correct? Well, uh, there also is something that uh, I testified to previously that relates to the Tarasoff decision that's... Well, uh, I'm getting to Tarasoff next, but for the moment, mm -hmm. you knew that although you had no duty whatsoever to tell anybody anything, if you were being a reasonable therapist, if there was a believable threat against a third party, you had a right to tell that person. That's what you understood, right? That's I understood that much, yes. Of course, Dr. Ozeal, if you were wrong, if your judgment later was questioned, if a court decided you didn't act reasonably, you could lose your license for revealing patient secrets, couldn't you? Um. That was never anything in my mind at all. Could, could that could, happen? It's considered unethical to reveal patient secrets unless you're justified, isn't it? Of, of course, any therapist could lose his or her license by wantonly revealing uh, uh, secrets with, for no reason. Sure. But not every therapist was on probation as of October 31st, 1989, but you were, correct? It's correct that I was on probation. Therefore, let's just assume hypothetically that you knew in your own head that whether you were threatened or not threatened, you're telling Ms. Smith had to do with your private, personal agenda with Ms. Smith. Let's assume hypothetically. Isn't it? All right, counsel, that's an argumentative question. Let's ask something else. Isn't it true that one of the purposes for your writing these notes up the way you did was to justify the fact that a couple of weeks before you told your unstable girlfriend patient secrets and now you were worried about whether or not she could be trusted. Isn't that what happened? Ms. Abramson, I'm sure... Is that sure what happened? 
You can answer Ms. the question, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Ms. No. Abramson, no, that isn't what happened. Now, in fact, you wound up moving your unstable girlfriend into your family home for three months, in, starting in December, didn't you? Would you like to ask me why? Sure. No, I would like to ask you what I would like to ask you, and that's, that's what I just reason. asked you. Now, can okay. you answer okay, it? Okay, let's not argue. Yes. You ask a question. The question was, did she move in? Uh, the, the answer is, yes, she did. And she lived there until she fled your house and went to the police, correct? Um, yes, that's basically correct. And isn't it true that over the course of your relationship with Ms. Smith, you frequently threatened her to control her behavior by telling her, aha, I'm going to tell Eric and Lyle that you know their secret and they'll come kill you. Didn't you do that? Quite the contrary. Dr. Ozeal, you know, do you not, that Ms. Smith made tape recordings of her conversations with you after she went to the police? Yes, I'm aware of that. And you've seen those tape recordings, have you not? Um, I've seen several of the tape recordings. And do you deny, Dr. Ozeal, that on those tape recordings you threaten that she will be killed if she goes to the police because you don't know yet that she's already gone? Sustain. Do you threaten Ms. Smith? Is it a Smith? question uh, that you're asking in the present tense? Is he doing it now, or is it something no, happened did, in the did past? He, did he? Okay, I was going to say, then, does he on the tapes? But okay, just I'll, I'll phrase it in the proper tense, please. On the tapes that Ms. Smith made for the police, can your voice be heard threatening that she will die if she goes to the police? No, my voice can be heard warning them that I thought that Eric or Lyle would kill her if she went to the police. And when she said to you, Eric and Lyle will be in jail, they can't kill me, you said, well, I'm going to make sure I'm going to put your name and the names of your friends in a file and make sure that they know that I'm not responsible for giving out the information. Do you remember saying that? No, I don't remember it, but it sounds like something that I could have said based upon the fact that uh, she was um, threatening to go to the police and she had previously threatened to falsely tell Eric and Lyle that I had been um, telling multiple people about the fact that they had, uh, um, they had committed the murder of their parents, which is totally false. Of course, she had never met Eric and Lyle as of March 5th when she went to the police, had she? Not to the best of my knowledge. And they still didn't know this woman even existed on, as far as you knew. Not as far as I knew. And didn't you, in fact, make a joke in front of Ms. Smith, a joke that you and she discuss in these telephone tapes? Didn't you, in fact, say in front of her that you were going to get Eric and Lyle to murder Richard Klein? I have no recollection of that, and it also may involve uh, privilege. So I have to claim the privilege with respect to that. With respect to what? I mean... All right, count, uh was your answer no or that you're claiming a privilege? I don't, I don't recall, and I'm also wanting to claim the privilege with respect to any uh, mm -hmm. further mention of that. You well, Your Honor, he can't deny something. Well, counsel, let's not argue such a matter uh, at this point. Uh, why don't you move on to something else unless you need to have this resolved at this point? Now you, uh, you mentioned before there's another aspect to the Tarasoff decision that you're aware of. Is that right, Dr. Ozeal? Um, overall. Is that right? Um, I don't know what you mean by another uh, part or whatever. Can you clarify? Well, we're talking about 1024 and the fact that, you know, a reasonable therapist who is faced with a credible threat uh, uh, can warn somebody even though they have to give up confidential information to do it. That's 1024, correct? Um, yes. But then there's a case called Tarasoff versus Regents of the University of California. Are you familiar with that case? I'm somewhat familiar with the case. And that is a case that established the legal principle in California that if a therapist 
doesn't warn a, a known potential victim of a truly dangerous patient, that therapist can be sued by the aggrieved parties. Isn't that what Tarasov says? That's not at all what I recalled about Tarasov. And well, you recall Tarasov was a case where there was a psychiatrist who worked for the well, university. Well, let's not go into it. And uh, the issue is what he remembers of it. Tarasov is a case that created civil liability, liability to lawsuit. Well, again, you're telling him something. I want to um, ask him if that's how he understands well, it. Well, let's ask him. Uh, he mentioned it. Uh, what was the, the, yeah, well, why did, did you, you mention understand? the Tarasov case? I, I only mentioned the Tarasov case as a way of saying that there, in addition to 1024, there is a not only a duty to warn, and I wasn't thinking of civil liability, but rather professional responsibility, a duty to warn. And in addition to that, I mentioned it because it also talks about taking whatever steps are reasonable to prevent the threatened danger. And in my judgment, the steps I took were the reasonable steps necessary to prevent the threatened danger. And You're that's right, all I, I meant by Tarasov. I'm going to move to strike the witnesses deciding to ask him questions and then answering them. That was not responsive. No, to the, the objection question. is overruled. The witness did mention that case, and this was a question asked to explain why he mentioned it. Objection now, are overruled. you saying that you were unaware that basically what Tarasov does is it makes a therapist liable to lawsuit if they don't? fulfill that duty to warn a third person. You didn't know anything about that part? I don't know if I did or didn't know anything. I didn't relate to that in any way. It I wasn't, wasn't what I remembered you, about that. I did, didn't did recall. Did you know about that part? I don't know that I did. I don't think I did. Do you belong to the American Psychological Association? Uh, no, I don't at present. Do you belong to the California Psychological Association? No, I don't. You need to find something. Read any. Do you read the American Psychologist? No, it's foundational, Your Honor. The objection is overruled to just that question. Do you ever read that periodical? Uh, uh, not uh, recently, no. Do you know who John Monahan is? Uh, no, I don't. Have you ever read anything about limiting therapist exposure? to Tarasov liability? No, I don't. Never read about that at all? No, I haven't. Do you know, Dr. Ozeal, how much money, I'll strike that, do you know how much, how much money you billed to Eric and Lyle Menendez between October 31st, 1989 and the time of their arrest? No, I do not. Would you like to add it? You have the ledgers? Or no, I don't have the ledgers. Would you like a pen? Uh, if you think I'll need one. Did you want me to add this up? I want you to add up how much you charge them between October 31st <coughs> and March the 8th. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, my ledger cards are, are uh, a little confusing because I have Eric and Lyle's uh, names separately, then I have them on a sheet together. Do you know what the total is? And I'll try to work backwards. I, I'm not sure how much I You can just them. add them together. Treat them as one unit.
I'm not really sure. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's hard to determine from these cards. It's hard to determine from the cards. Uh, yeah, I'm confused about uh, exactly how much I build them. So well, perhaps maybe we'll work on it during the break. Okay. Now you've testified that on November second. When uh, Eric and Lyle were describing the reasons why their mother was killed, basically you're saying that it's because once there was a plan, she fit into the plan and they couldn't give up the plan. Is that basically what they were saying? That's correct. They couldn't. They couldn't figure out a way to um, to have the father killed and still have the mother left alive. It, it uh, wouldn't work. OK, then I ask you, Dr. Ozeal, what was the plan? The plan? The, the plan. plan. You mean the specific plan I've already elaborated in terms of what they did? No, no, no. What you do is what you do. But what was the plan before anything was done? The plan was to do what they did. The plan was to, uh, what do you mean to do what they did? To walk into the family room and shoot their parents, that's a plan? That was the plan? I didn't say that. Well, why don't you tell me, what was this plan? You've described it as a plan. You've described it as a perfect plan, as an unchangeable plan. What was the plan? All right, it is argumentative. Uh, objection sustained. Can you tell me what the plan was that you have indicated they both referred to repeatedly? Um, as per the discussion that, um, that I had with Eric and Eric and Lyle, the plan was to uh, find a way to kill the father in a way, well, just first of all, to kill the father. Okay, and let's stop there. Mm -hmm. So they had to find a way to kill the father. In a right? way such that they weren't, they were not detected. Okay. So they needed to find a way to kill the father in a way they would not be detected. That was the plan. I didn't say that. You, you at, that's only the first uh, sentence out of my mouth. OK. So that's not the plan. That's just a decision to kill the father. That's what it sounds like. Okay. Counsel, again, you are s stating your own personal opinions, which are not evidence. Uh, the uh, comment is stricken. The jury's admonished to disregard it. Ask is, another question, please. Is this the same as your plan to buy shotguns? Um, no, I wouldn't uh, characterize them as being uh, the same at all. Well, you said they needed to find a way to kill the father in a way they would not be t detected. That was the idea behind the plan. Is that right? The initial goal was to get the father out of their life. They couldn't figure out how to live and how to um, be able to continue living um, and feel any freedom at all or any ability to be happy with the father in their life. And that was the inception of them sitting down and beginning to discuss how to accomplish that end. And okay. they had a series of discussions over time that changed variously that related to what to do and which elements to put in the plan and which elements to take out of the plan and whether to put the mother in the plan, leave her in the plan, or take her out of the plan. And um, those discussions took place over a period of time. What was the plan? You've told us the goal, kill the father. What's the plan? The an Overall, had you finished the answer, by the way? Uh, no. <coughs> All right, the question is, again, so what, what was, was the plan? plan they eventually work out if, over these discussions over time? What is the plan? And, and I'm, uh, I'm assuming that you're, you're asking me only uh, elements that I knew of as of October 31st and November 2nd. Your Honor, I'm going to object. Move to strike that remark and ask that the witness be admonished. All right. The question is uh, relating to the two conversations on those two dates. OK. Um, it's, in these, it's in these notes. From these two days that you use the word plan repeatedly, isn't that true? Uh, yes, it's true. And after all, you dictated these notes. These are all your words, correct? Uh, Sustained. Well, whether you're trying to repeat what someone else said, the only thing we know for sure is if I listen to this tape, I hear El Jerome Ozeal, right? I would think so. Yes. 
So you use the word plan over and over again. What was the plan? The plan was to um, kill the father um, in some violent way um, that evolved into the purchase of shotguns that did include finding a way to uh, predict um, when they would be able to kill the father and the mother in a way and also develop an alibi um, about uh, uh, where they would be such that they would not uh, be detected and also to, um, to think through the different things that could, um, that could link them to the crime and um, to make sure that they thought of all different aspects of things that they thought could link them to the crime and try to develop a way such as to rule out any of the things that would be evidence uh, that would be left at the crime scene and to have an effective alibi and then to pick a time when their mother and father um, were in a situation in the home and to uh, ultimately to kill the mother and the father but as I said it was not their original um, idea or motive to kill their mother that was something that evolved well now did they tell you that they <clears throat> couldn't think of a single way that they could have killed their father without their mother being in the room is that what they were telling you? they never said those specific things at all did they tell you that this uh, wine tasting party was an effective alibi when they got there after the place had closed? Uh, they did believe that the wine tasting party would be a, uh, an alibi. Uh-huh. And when, to your knowledge, Dr. Ozeal, did they even find out there was such a thing as that wine tasting party that day? Um, they never discussed with me, Eric or Lyle, when they specifically came up with the wine tasting party. But it was your understanding that this wine tasting party was part of a plan that was being debated over some period of time? No, it was my understanding that they began discussions of how to uh, conclude or effect the, uh, the murders um, some period of time before the murders and that the plan evolved until it felt like it had um, a, a perfect uh, uh, element to it where it, it wasn't possible for them to be detected and once they had it in that perfect form they didn't alter it. Well let me, let me see if I understand this. They didn't give you any information whatsoever about any kind of synchronized or worked out or thought through set of or chain of events. Because I'm not hearing that from you. Um, what in other I, words, they shot their parents in the middle of their own neighborhood, in the middle of the house, at 10 o'clock at night. Was that the plan? Uh, objection argumentative. Sustain. Well, was that the plan? We're going to Objection shoot sustain. Ask another question. Was the plan, we'll shoot our parents with two 12-gauge shotguns in the middle of Beverly Hills at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night and hope that later the police will be silly enough to let us go back to our car where we could take the rest of the shotgun shells out. Was that the plan? Your Honor, Objection, Objection sustained. Did they tell you there was a plan to purposely shoot their parents in their own home on a Sunday night? Counsel, the court has already sustained the objection. Well, Your Honor, it's I don't see argumentative. It. Rephrase the question. Can we have our break right now? Let's go a little further here. Your next question, please. You omitted from your direct testimony a statement that was made to you that. Uh, they had gone back to the car after the police were at the scene and the police let them go into their own car and they took out evidence at that time, shotgun shells, empties, full ones. Isn't that true? You were told that. Absolutely correct. Okay. Was that part of the plan? To no, call the police not. before you've cleaned out the evidence? No, it was not part of any plan. So that was just mere happenstance that the police let that happen. Objection, argumentative. Sustained. Did, is that what you were told, that it was just lucky? Told by whom? By, the, by Eric and Lyle. When was this? On October 31st. Um, yes, I was told that it was uh, just lucky and that they had left, uh, left shells around in the car and absolutely that it was lucky. That's what I was told. And, and 
was there any indication when you were told this that that in that they didn't think maybe the plan was so perfect since it took luck to keep them from getting arrested that night? Uh, Sustain. Well, Your Honor, I'd like to be heard. I don't believe that was argumentative. All right, uh, we'll let you be heard at the sidebar here. All right, why don't you rephrase that question and then we'll let you take a break. Okay, did um, <laughs> you guys get I'm not done yet. <laughs> Did uh, either Eric or Lyle, in commenting upon uh, the luck of having removed evidence from the car, indicate that uh, this was an imperfection in this otherwise perfect plan? Uh, yes, I don't think that Eric and Lyle felt, in retrospect, that, uh, that the plan was actually carried off uh, uh, perfectly. And I can recall um, numerous statements that in particular um, were made by uh, Eric uh, that night that again are not in this record, which relate to Eric having said that it was extremely imperfectly um, um, committed. And I can remember all sorts of things that they said that are not in the record. Well, right. did they mention to you that another aspect in which uh, they just got lucky, which is that the Beverly Hills Police Department never did any gunshot residue testing on their hands or they would have been arrested that night? I don't know if they mentioned that or not, but they, uh, I remember very specifically Eric mentioning to me the uh, shotgun shells and, uh, and frankly kind of shaking his head about the police department, <laughs> you know, saying that he, he couldn't, you know, couldn't believe they let him go back to the car. Um, I mean, that's just frankly, that's what he said. So um, he couldn't believe that he didn't get arrested that night. That's correct. This would be a good time for a all right, we'll take a recess and we'll resume in 15 minutes, which is 25 minutes after the hour. Don't discuss this case with anyone or for any final opinions about it. We'll resume at 325. In the trial, the defendants are both in court with their attorneys. The people are represented. And both juries are in the courtroom. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And we're ready to resume with the trial. The people still have a witness on a witness stand being cross-examined. Dr. Ozeal, would you get back on the witness stand, please? <laughs> and would you state your name again for the record? Dr. L. Jerome Ozeal. All right, I'll remind you that you're still under oath and the cross-examination by Mr. Burt. Sir, I'd like to start with just briefly reviewing some of the chronology here so that we have fresh in our minds some time periods, okay? You have in front of you the ledger cards? Yes, I do. And also your appointment book? That's correct. Okay. Could you... Yes. Could you look first at the ledger cards, Dr. Ozeal, uh, just to refresh your memory on some dates here. Is it true that you first began seeing members of the Menendez family on September 30th, 1988? That appears to be the case. And do you recall on that date who it was that you saw? Um, <clears throat> I believe that I saw um, Jose and Kitty Menendez not as patients, but telling me about... Okay, uh, just... Uh, sorry. The Cut. question was, who did you see? You can answer that uh, by names, if you okay. Kitty and Jose Menendez, and I'm not clear on whether I saw Eric or I did not see Eric the same day. All right, and on that date, you is it true, according to your ledger cards, that you billed um, $150, which would have been, I think you testified for a 45-minute session, correct? That's correct. All right. Does the ledger card reflect when you first had a session with Eric Menendez? Uh, the first named session with Eric Menendez appears to be October 4th. And you billed uh, $250 for that session, which according to your ledger is one and one-fourth hour, correct? That's correct. Right. And on the same day, after you had your session with Eric, did you then have a consultation with the parents? Uh, that's correct. Now, how is that reflected on the ledger card? 
Well, it appears to be just M, M and M double. I mean, I'm assuming that that's what that means. I didn't write this. <laughs> All right. What, what it says is 10-4 and then M slash M DBL. Uh, are you say, yes. Are you saying that what that probably represents is uh, mother and father for a double session? Uh, that's that would be my best guess about what it represents. That's not any terminology that I would have ever used, and my secretary has apparently wrote that. And that was Sandy, that, who that probably would, wrote this. Yes, that would be correct. Sandy. She handled all all of your billing. Is that correct? Um, most of my billing. And that session or consultation with the parents took place after you had uh, had a consultation with Eric Menendez. Is that right? Um, I believe so. I don't know if it did. There's no, there's no way for me to know whether it took place after or before. It could have taken place before. She could have just listed it later. I have no idea. And don't know. You billed um, the parents $300 for that double session on the 4th, correct? Uh, that's correct. That's perfectly correct. Now, <clears throat> when is the first time you saw Lyle Menendez? Um, appears to be 11-2. Okay, do you want to look at the entry 10-5? Oh, sorry. Yes, it doesn't say Lyle. It says older son. Yes, that... Uh, as far as you know, is that Lyle? Yes, that, that would do. be and Lyle. that would have been the day after you saw Eric and the parents, correct? Uh, that's correct. And you billed him $500, which is three and a half sessions, correct? I don't know if that's three and a half or three and a third. Uh, it looks to be three and a third sessions. I, I don't know. In any event, you billed him $500 That's for that correct. session. And then is the next entry, after you saw Lyle, you again met with the parents on October 12th, 1988. That's correct. And you had a double session with them where you billed the parents $450. Well, uh, yes, that looks correct. Mm -hmm. And then after that session, you met with Eric on the 14th and the 25th of October 1988, correct? That's correct. All right, and then continuing on, um, through the end of 1988, you saw Lyle on November 2nd, November 16th, correct? That appears to be correct. And for those sessions, you billed him $150 per session? That's correct. And then he had an appointment on the 29th of November 1988, but he didn't show up, correct? That's correct. And you saw him on December 2nd, 1988? appears to be correct. You billed him $150 for that session. That's correct. You saw him on December 9th for a $150 session. That's correct. You saw him on December 14th for another $150 session. Appears to be correct. And then continuing on the next page of that exhibit, you saw him on the 17th, the 18th, and the 24th of January 1989, correct? I'm assuming that's correct. It says L, so... And there's a notation on the 24th indicating at that point that Lyle was going back to school, correct? Um, yeah, it looks like that, yes. You billed him $400 for that session on the 24th? Appears to be correct. And for the 18th and the 17th, you billed him $150 per session, right? Appears to be correct. And after you saw him on the 24th, is it true that the very next time you saw Lyle Menendez, was when you consulted with him on December 23rd, 1989. Um, December 23rd, 1989. I'm trying to find that here. Excuse me, August 23rd, 1989. Oh, August 23rd. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, that appears to be correct. And you, on that date, on the 23rd, billed um, $450 for a consultation with both Eric and Lyle, correct? Correct. And on the 24th, um, you again saw them, and according to your ledger, it was one half Eric and one half Lyle, correct? Uh, I believe that that's <clears throat> the one half Eric and one half Lyle is, it was their agreement as to how to divide the... Uh, the uh, uh, bill. It, it doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of time that I spent with each of the uh, individuals. In other words, you could have spent three-fourths of that time with Eric, one-fourth with Lyle, but they'd each pay half the bill. They just agreed that that's how they wanted to handle the bill. 
And on August 24th, 1989, you, according to your ledger, had eight sessions plus one half hours, so that's correct? That's correct. And you billed them $1,300? That's correct. And, and was that the occasion where you went over to the Bel Air Hotel? That's correct, best of my recollection. And spent the whole day over there with him, basically? Uh, eight sessions would uh, not be a whole day, but it would be the better part of the day. And, and you were billing them there not just for private consultations with them, but also discussions with the family, correct? Well, what I was billing them for was um, a consultation um, and my time, which is just my my practice, whether I'm spending a day in court with somebody, if in fact, in fact they want me there, or if, if I'm doing psychological testing, I bill for my time. So I'm just billing for my time and the consultation. Now, the very next day, uh, which would have been August 25th, you had another session with the both of them. Is that right? Appears to be correct. And you billed them $150, correct? That's correct. On the 26th of August, 1989, you billed Eric uh, $600 for a session with him alone, correct? For four sessions. Four mm -hmm. sessions. Correct. On August... October 31st is when uh, you have testified that you had a session first with Eric and then you made your call for a while join the session, is that right? That's correct. And you billed uh, for that session on the 31st, uh, one session with Eric for $150, correct? Um, yes. And then you also billed five sessions on the 31st for one half Eric, one half Ryan. Correct. For $750. Just to be correct. Is that the $150 billing reflect the time you spent with Eric before La Menendez um, they negotiated uh, between the two of them how they wanted to handle that, and what I put down just reflected whatever they negotiated. It, it doesn't uh, reflect the amount of time I spent with um, Eric. Did you build it? Six times 45 minutes. That's my belief and recollection, would have been. Now, it was on that date that um, you said that you felt threatened. That's correct. And then I think you also testified that the next time you met them, either one of the Menendez brothers was on November 2nd, 1989, correct? Correct. And your billing reflects that on that day, you billed them for three and a half hours for a total of $700, right? Just to be correct. And is it also true that it was on that day that, according to your testimony, you had this conversation where, you, again, you felt threatened? That's correct. And is it also true that after that session on November 2nd, you continued to see the Menendez brothers for a substantial period of time, according to the That's correct. In fact, you saw Eric on November 28th in building $300, correct? Correct. You build them for a session on the what? December 5th, 1989, where he did not show up, but he had an appointment. Correct. You build Eric for a session on December 6th, 89, $150. Correct. And actually had a session with him on that day. First you said. And on December 8th, you build him Eric for a one and a half session visit for two minutes. First you right. And on the 8th, you also had a separate session, according to your ledger, with Lot, correct? Correct. One and a half sessions, you built in $225,000. In fact, I'm reading this, actually. It's a bottom of the <laughs> Be right. December 12th, you had a double session with Eric, and you gave him $300. Right. On the 13th, you had a double session with Lyle, where you gave him $300. Correct. December 19th, you had a double session with Eric, and you gave him $300. Seriously, right? 
December 20th, build Lyle for a $300 session, and Eric, excuse me, just Lyle for that date, but he didn't show, correct? Correct. You build him for a double session there. Right. And then on the 26th of December, Eric had an appointment which was not kept, you didn't bill him, correct? Correct. On the 27th, Lyle had an appointment and it was canceled, you didn't bill him. Correct. And then Lyle had a double session on what looks to be December 20th. Can you read that? Uh, no, it looks like it's uh, uh, 1220. Uh, Are you talking about? Uh, yes. Yeah, 1220. Lyle no show, is that what you're? No, it saying? says 1220 Lyle DBL, which is a double session. No, that, that looks to be 1222. 1222. Looks to be. So you met him on December 22nd for a double session and you billed him $300, right? It looks like that. And then going into 1990, you met the, um, Eric for a double session on January 2nd, billed him $300. Right. You met Lyle for a double session on January 3rd. And with both Eric and Lyle for a double session. Correct. You billed Lyle $300 on January 16th for an appointment with you. On the 23rd, you met with Lyle for a double session. Apparently. And on the 30th, you also met with Lyle and billed him $300 for a session, correct? Mm, appears right. And then just to finish that out, on February 6, 1990, you met with Eric and Lyle and billed them each $300. Yes. On the 13th, you met with them both and billed them $300 a piece, correct? Appears to be correct. And then continuing on the next page, which is a ledger sheet just for Lyle Menendez. You met him on the 20th in building $300. Um, I'm sorry, where are we? With the next sheet, yes. the next ledger, it's in the name Lyle Menendez only. Um, and you see at the top, it says balance from old, okay, yes. old uh, card, $5,300. Okay. So and we're on the 20th now? Right, okay. and it indicates that he paid you $5,500 on February 13th, 1990. Yes, it does. And it indicates that on the 20th of February, you had another session with Lyle where you billed him $300. Well, I don't know that I had a session or I didn't. It does say $300. Well, you billed him for it. Yeah, session. he was billed for it. And it doesn't indicate no-show, correct? Well, it doesn't say anything, so right. I, I wouldn't have any idea. On the 27th, you billed him again $300 for That's a session. Again, yes, I don't know if he was there or not. And on March 6th, you billed him for a session for $300, correct? And he was billed. And the last page, which is a ledger card for Eric Menendez, you billed him for a session on February 6th, 13th, 20th, and the 27th, correct? Um, he was billed, yes. And you also billed him March 6th, 1990. Yes, he canceled and was billed. And so you were seeing them according to that ledger um, right up to the time when the police seized the tape that you've referred to from your home pursuant to a search warrant. Is that right? It looks to be. And your understanding was that they were arrested shortly thereafter? That's my understanding. Right. Now, returning to the October 31st session, I think you testified that one of the first things you discussed with Eric and Lyle after Lyle arrived were, was the limits of confidentiality. Is that right? That's right. And I think you said that one of the first things you talked about were the occasions where confidentiality did not apply. Correct? 
That's correct. And I think you testified that you explained to them about child abuse and threats and a couple of other situations where confidentiality would not be applicable, correct? That's correct. And what you told them was that if either one of them threatened you, that what they told you in the session was not confidential. Is that right? That's correct. You also told them at the very beginning of the session, when they were both present, that you might be able to help them in the event that they were ever brought to trial. Is that correct? Well, at some point in the context of a discussion, um, I told them that uh, it might be helpful to be able to explain the family dynamics that, uh, that led up to the commission of the murder um, if, in fact, they were ever brought to trial. And did you elaborate on that at all as to how you were going to help them or what the procedure was for helping them? You're referring to October 31st? Yeah. Uh, not to the best of my recollection. In fact, I don't think I said I would help you. I think that what I said is that it may be helpful for me to uh, be able to explain the family dynamics that uh, contributed to the murder of your parents. What, uh, what went on to uh, basically uh, cause you to ultimately end up murdering your parents. And was this explained to them in the October 31st session or the November 2nd or both? Um, I think it was in one form or another addressed in both sessions. Where in your notes is that reflected as to the October 31st session, if you have those in front of you? It isn't present in the October 31st notes, and it's it's entirely possible that, uh, you know, that I know for certain I did November 2nd, but um, I don't see it in the notes, actually. It might be there, but I don't see it. And is it true that the November 2nd notes begin with your statement, uh, quote, I further stated that there were some ways in which the possession of my part of this information could potentially be helpful. Namely, I related to Eric and Lyle that in the event they were brought to trial for their parents' murder, that I might be able to piece together some of the events in their family constellation that led to them having the hatred and abuse, most particularly from their father, that could have led to such an event occurring. That's correct. It does state that. And, and that, in substance, is what you told them at the very beginning of the interview. Is that right? The beginning of the interview on the 2nd? On November 2nd. Um, well... S sometime into the interview, yes, on November 2nd. And it's your testimony that you probably gave them the same statement on October 31st, although you don't see it reflected in the notes. Well, I'm not sure that I gave it to them October 31st, but I'm definitely sure I gave it to them uh, November 2nd. Well, I think you did testify that one of the things you discussed at the very beginning of the October 31st session w was the limits of confidentiality, correct? <laughs> Yes, but the limits of confidentiality is a discrete and separate issue from the issue of whether something I could um, say in the event they were brought to trial would be helpful if they're not connected uh, concepts or statements. And so the discussion about helping them in the context of uh, any trial that might come up was maybe didn't take place until November 2nd? I'm not sure. I know it took place November 2nd. I'm not sure about uh, October 31st. And is it also true that at the end of the November 2nd session, and looking at the page, bottom of page 18, that Lyle in particular was very concerned that you didn't get enough details down of the session? That's absolutely true. And it is, is it also true that uh, he said he wanted the notes to accurately reflect things that he thought might mitigate the severity of the crime he committed? in the event he was ever cr caught. Yes, he did say that. Did he tell you he needed you as a witness? Well, I think that, uh, as I testified, he didn't 
state the words. He didn't say, I need you as a witness. But basically, my interpretation from his telling me that uh, he wanted me to get all of the uh, uh, detail down to mitigate um, whatever happened was that he needed me as a witness. All right. And as I understand it, then, it, he comes into the session October 31st. You tell him the limits of confidentiality. You tell him that the information might potentially be of use uh, to him in a trial. And later on, he states to you that he wanted you to get down the details of what he was saying, correct? That's correct. And did he appear to understand that your suggestion that you were possibly going to be of use to him in any trial that might come up? Uh, did he appear to understand what right. that meant? Did, did he appear not to be able to process that information? No, I think he was processing that information. Did. Did he indicate to you that he hadn't thought of that, but n something along the lines of now that you mention it, it's a good idea? No, not now that you mention it's a good idea. I think that he, he just said that he hadn't considered that the possession of notes or records of what he had said could be um, helpful. Um, didn't comment on whether it was a good idea or not. He mentioned that he hadn't considered that your possession of the notes could be helpful. Correct. And then after that discussion is when you say that you had this um, discussion about the, the killings themselves, correct? Um, I'm not sure of the sequencing. You uh, want to refer me back to the... Yeah, on, on November 2nd, I think, at some point after you had that discussion about you being of use to them mm -hmm. in a potential trial, you then proceeded to discuss with them the killings themselves. Isn't that true? Well, I don't know. Let me go back to the uh, point in the notes here. Can you refer me to the page that you're... Well, you tell me. Can you First of all, can you testify from your own independent recollection of what was said on the date of November 2nd? Do you have any independent recollection of the conversation? I have lots of independent recollections, but I don't know whether um, I had that particular conversation immediately after the conversation you just mentioned. I'd have to refresh my notes to see the sequencing of it. I know I had the conversation, but I don't know the exact sequencing. Let me refer you to a specific conversation that you had in reference. I think you said that at one point you offered them uh, a scenar two different scenarios of the kind of killings, and you characterize each. Do you remember that discussion? Yes, I did. And when did that discussion take place in reference to your telling them that you could be potentially helpful to them in a trial, and after warning them that if they threatened you, that there was no confidentiality? Um, well, that took place significantly after me, me warning them about the confidentiality issue. Um, and did that discussion also take place after what you perceived to be threats? Did the conversation about the different kinds of murders take place? Yes. Yes, it definitely did. And in fact, the threats, according to you, took place as early as October 31st, right? They did take place October 31st and uh, November 2nd. And the discussion about the different types of, of uh, killings took place well after both the threats and your discussion with them about the limits of confidentiality and how you could be potentially helpful to them in the event they were brought to trial. That's correct. And you offered them those two options, and they basically indicated that option A was the one that best fit their situation. By Is option A, you mean what? I think you testified that you offered them two options. One was a premeditated killing with no feelings, and the other was a heat of passion killing where someone does something on the spur of the moment. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Loosely, that that was the categorization which you offered to them? That's correct. And after all this discussion about possibly not being confidential, that you were there to help them develop mitigating information for their trial. I didn't say that. You didn't say that? I didn't say I was there to help them develop mitigating information. All right. W without yeah, quibbling that. about the words, you told them you, were, you could be potentially helpful to them in a trial, correct? That, that, the te that my testimony about why things took place might be helpful, not that I was there to help them uh, develop uh, mitigating uh, uh, circumstances. And it's also true, is it not, that they, from the very beginning on October 31st, reflected some skepticism in terms of whether what they were going to tell you was going to be confidential. Oh, I think there was a disbelief initially that, uh, that confidentiality meant anything. I think that there was a, on Lyle's part anyway, a, a complete dismissal of it. And in fact, he was telling you what's going to prevent you from going to the police? Yeah, he didn't believe that 
uh, as I was describing confidentiality and the limits of it, I think that he had already concluded in his own mind that there was no way to believe any of that and that basically, uh, you know, that I was a, an unsafe person to keep around. I don't think he was believing any of the confidentiality uh, statement I was making. And yet you say that he proceeded to sign on to a, a version which would indicate premeditated killings, correct? A, an aversion? Aversion. Version. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by that. Could you uh, tell me? Well, let's back up. At some point after he expressed his skepticism that this was going to remain confidential, and specifically in the November 2nd session, you offered him two versions of the killings, correct? Correct. Option A was a premeditated killing. Option B was a heat of passion, emotional killing, right? That's correct. So he, according to your testimony, signed on to a version which would indicate premeditated killing, did he not? He did. And that was despite the fact that he had indicated some skepticism about whether that session was going to remain confidential. Isn't that true? Um, the, the primary session in which he expressed um, a conclusion that things were not going to make, remain confidential was the October 31st session. So yes, in the November 2nd session, at the point at which he was um, making the choice between pattern A and pattern B, uh, yes, there had already been a discussion about the confidentiality and, and the limits of it. And was there any indication that you had that he had changed his mind between October 31st and November 2nd? That is, as far as you, you were concerned, did it still seem like he was skeptical of your any claim of confidentiality that you may have been making? I'd be speculating. In fact, you told him that there was potential confidentiality, correct? You never told him that it was confidential. That's correct. To that meeting with the prosecutors and Detective Zoller, that you said you made the one tape of the October 31st, November 2nd session after the second session, and that, and that it was within a week of the second session by the 9th of November. Remember stating that? I don't remember it. You don't remember stating that? Or you no, don't? I, I don't remember stating that. I mean, I'm not saying that's not correct. I just don't remember stating it. Well, that was a conversation that occurred just in June of 1993, correct? Correct. And you don't recall that conversation, but you say you do have independent recollection of a conversation that occurred four years ago? Well, I'm, that's possible. I'm not saying that I, that I uh, didn't state that. I'm only saying I don't remember that particular statement. You, you have a lapse in memory as to whether you said that, in other words. I just can't clearly recall that I said it. And do you also remember stating to Detective Zoller and the two prosecutors in this case on June 21st, 1993, that you had some written notes of the sessions, but you destroyed them after you made the tape? Um, yeah, I don't think that's correct. I think, I think that- The question the, is, yes, did you yeah, say- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, I, uh, I do recall having said that. All right, fine. And so it's true, is it not, um, that the notes which you dictated on tape may have been made as late as November 9th? Um, they may have been. Is there any um, reason why the 9th sticks out in your mind as to the date when you may have dictated the notes? Uh, just that I remember what I was doing uh, up to, um, I think, the 6th. And the best of my recollection was that I made the uh, the first tapes of the first couple of sessions um, very near the time that I bought the uh, the two shotguns. And so um, since that was, I, I best of my recollection was at the 6th? Well, what's your recollection? Do you uh, recall when you uh, bought the shotguns? Uh, I believe it was around the 6th, November 6th. And that's about the time that I uh, made the notes, a little bit before that or around that time. Could have been a little bit after. Could have been, but I remember that that uh, that that's basically um, when I made the notes. Sometime so, a little bit before that, or or a little, a little bit, bit after. A, possibly could have been after, and or likely to be before. But if you told the detective and the two prosecutors that it was as late as the ninth, that would be wrong. Is that your testimony now? No, I'm not saying that would be wrong. I'm saying that uh, that that's the outside that it, these events did take place four years ago, and I can't be 100% um, certain about that particular um, memory about the exact day that I uh, tape recorded those uh, dictated notes. And were you tape recording the notes from 
the journal entries that you've testified about? No, I was not. In other words, you were doing it completely from your own recollection, whatever date that was that you taped the notes, right? That, that's correct. And at the time you were dictating the notes, were you still in fear for your life? Um, yes, I was. But was the fear greater, lesser, about the same? How would you characterize it? Lesser. And is it true that between the November 2nd session and the dictation of your notes that you had no contact with the Menendez brothers until November 28th, 1989? That appears to be correct from the, uh, from the ledger cards. And if you had a greater fear, would it have been because you didn't know whether the brothers went on vacation or not? Um, that would be correct. So you were dictating I those. Believe they, I knew they didn't go on vacation specifically. And so would it be fair to say that you probably were operating under a greater fear as opposed to a lesser one when you dictated those notes? No, I don't think that would be fair to say. Could it, it, it may have been a lesser fear then. I think I had a lesser fear at that point than I had the night of the 31st for sure. All right. And have you listened to your voice on the tape of your notes? I think that I listened to my voice uh, four years ago. I don't recall anything about how my voice sounds. You sounded on the tapes. Do you recall whether you sounded fearful on the tapes? Um, I didn't recall that I sounded, um, I, I, don't, I don't recall, frankly. It was four years ago. And the tapes themselves don't purport to be verbatim recollections of everything that took place in, the, in those two sessions, do they? Parts of them are verbatim, and parts of them are not. Well, how long did it take you to dictate the October 31st session? I'd be totally guessing. The, the entire two sessions are, what, about 19 pages in notes? Approximately 19 pages of uh, what looks to be double-spaced notes. And the sessions themselves, I think the October 31st session was four, four and a half hours? Yes. And it's not your testimony that those notes contain everything that was said on October 31st, is it? No, in fact, it's been my testimony specifically. The notes don't contain everything that was said. And that would also apply to the November 2nd, correct? Yes, it would. Well, what's in the notes are things that you chose to emphasize as important to you at the time you were dictating those notes. Isn't that true? No, that's not. That's not true? No, it isn't. All right. Did you, at some point in time, make a more complete record of the two sessions? Not that I recall. I don't think I ever... Uh made any other record of the session than uh, these. Now, when Lyle came into the session on October 31st, I think he testified that he was both menacing and threatened. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. Threatened and threatening, I think he used that term. Do you recall that? Yes. How was he threatened? Why, why did you characterize him as being threatened? You know, that, that was totally internal, meaning that was just my assumption about how he might be feeling. He never said he was threatened. Why did you assume that? I assume that because um, uh, Eric uh, told me that he was concerned that Lyle might uh, kill him for telling me uh, uh, what happened um, and for having confessed the murder. And knowing that Lyle didn't know that Eric uh, told me that I, Lyle definitely didn't want Eric to tell me and that he just wouldn't want me to know that, uh, that uh, Eric had confessed the murder. He didn't want anybody to know that, that uh, they'd committed the murder. Was he very upset when he first arrived? Yes, he was. And was it your perception he was upset at his brother because his brother had confided in you? Yes, among other things. And was there a discussion between Eric and Lyle at that point, at the very beginning of the session after Lyle arrived, where Lyle was basically uh, yelling at Eric for having told you? No, he wasn't yelling. He, he never raised his voice? No, Lyle actually doesn't yell a lot. He's a... Uh, he's Objection. Did, huh? did he raise his voice is the question. <laughs> yes or no? Right. Did he raise his voice? Yes or no? Um, his voice was raised, but he wasn't yelling. Well, was it raised to the extent that someone out in your waiting room could hear his voice, do you think? Not to my belief. And was he yelling at you as opposed to yelling at Eric? He was equally intense, I think, with both of us. Now, this, as far as you knew, came as a complete surprise to Lyle. This meaning your disclosure to him that, Lyle, that Eric had told you that he had confessed to the killing, correct? That would certainly be true. 
and you expected when he came came there that he would have a certain amount of difficulty dealing with being surprised by that information, did you not? Uh, yes, I absolutely did. That was one of the reasons why you wanted him over there, because you wanted to control the situation in terms of dealing with Lyle's emotion and handling his brother's disclosure to you, correct? I wanted to diffuse it uh, for Eric and myself as much as I could, yes. And did it seem to you, um, as time went on in that October 31st session, that, Eric, that Lyle was being protective of Eric? Yes or no? Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, there, there, were, there were a lot of very mixed messages about that. Well, do you remember stating in your notes that Lyle was very protective? At somewhere in the notes I stated that, but there also were many other statements that were contradictory to that, so sometimes people behave in contradictory ways and say contradictory things. Yes, and so he may very well have been protective. I think he was uh, threatening and protective simultaneously. All right. And it's your testimony that after you had this discussion with him, that he, Eric, left the room first, correct? Eric left the room first. And then Lyle went out, correct? That's correct. And did you, at that point, lock the door and keep yourself safely within your office? No, I did not at that point. Did you feel that you could handle the situation? Uh, I didn't know whether I could handle the situation, but I thought I certainly had better try. Well, you testified, I think, that you were in great fear for your life at that point. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And yet you followed uh, both these brothers out on a dark street at what, about 10 o'clock at night? Uh, yes, that's about right. Did you? Um, no, I, I don't, it wouldn't have been 10 o'clock at night. I think it would have been more like 8 something at night. Well, what time did the session begin? I think it began about 4.15 and lasted something like uh, four and a half hours or something like that. So what time was it when Eric walked out and was followed by Lyle? Might have been closer to 8.30. And you walked out on the street. It was dark at that time? Well, there were street lights. It was dark. Eric was parked. As Eric's Jeep was parked uh, some, some distance up the street from uh, my office. Did you have a weapon with you when you walked out? No, I didn't. Did you feel that um, you were in great danger by going out on the street and actually walking up to the very people that you say you were in great fear of? I didn't think they were armed. In fact, I was almost certain they weren't armed, and I thought I would have been in great danger staying in my office and not resolving or trying to defuse the threat. So, no, I thought I was protecting myself by trying to uh, follow them out and trying to get them to continue to talk about things to resolve the even more explosive threat that I experienced with Eric bolting from the room and Lyle following him down on the street. So I, I didn't perceive that I was in threat following them. I perceived I was in great threat if I didn't follow them. So would it be fair to say that at least in terms of your own internal processing of the situation at that point, you weren't so fearful that you weren't thinking rationally? I'm sorry? Well, would it be fair to say that based on your own internal processing of the situation that you weren't in such great fear that you were acting completely irrationally at that point? I don't think I should be characterizing my, my uh, degree of rationality. I think I would say that those are the actions that I took and um, I was definitely feeling fearful. And so you approached them at their Jeep outside, correct? That's correct. Didn't know whether they had a weapon in the Jeep? Believe they didn't walked right up to the Jeep and tried to urge both of them to come back in with you. Is that right? That's correct. And it was at that point, according to your testimony, that Lyle uh, shook your hand and said, good luck, Dr. Ozeal, or words to that effect, correct? Among other things that he said, yes. Did, are you sure that conversation where he shook your hand and said, good luck, Dr. Ozeal, didn't happen up in your waiting room? Yes, I'm absolutely certain. Are you sure that it didn't happen at the elevator before you went down? 100% positive. In the presence of Judalon Smith? No way. You have no recollection of her being uh, outside in your waiting room when you came out following Lyle, correct? Do not have any. And she could not possibly have seen you talking with Lyle Menendez at the entrance to your elevator, correct? I don't believe so. At some point during the right after they left, I think you said that 
you called a number of people, correct, immediately after? That's correct. And when you were making those phone calls, you were in your office, correct? That's correct. Was Judalon Smith sitting on the desk um, watching you make these phone calls? N no, not, not to my recollection. She was wasn't. she rubbing the back of your neck trying to soothe you as you made these phone calls? No, she wasn't. You, are you positive of that or you just don't recall? No, I'm positive she wasn't sitting on my desk rubbing my neck. And I think you testified that one of the people you called was Bradley Brunon, correct? Um, I believe so. And you testified that you dialed Bradley Brunon from area code 310-278-6342. To the best of my recollection, I think I testified that I didn't recall when I called Bradley Brunon, whether it was that night or whether it was the next day or whatever. It was pretty, pretty soon after these events, but I can't state certainly when I called Bradley Brunon. Well, do you remember at page 9496 of the daily transcripts? August 4th. actually beginning at the bottom of page 9495. Your statement, I don't believe Judalon Smith was in my office. I don't recall having seen her. Question, do you know if she was there? I can know if she walked into the waiting room. No. Question, did she walk into your office, into your field division when you were making the phone calls? Answer, no. Question, who did you call? Answer, I called several attorneys. Question, who? Answer, I don't remember all the names of the attorneys that I called. Question, who do you remember? The answer, one of the people that I called was Mr. Brunon. Question, and you called him from your office phone. The answer, yes, I did. <coughs> Question, and what was the number of that phone? The answer, what was the number of Mr. Brunon's phone? Question, yours. The answer, my phone, 310-278-6342. Do you remember that testimony? Uh, yes. Your Honor, there's three more um Changes that should be read at this point. Put it in context. All right. Um, All right. Mr. Bird will continue. Question 278 6342. Answer That's correct. Question And did you reach Mr. Brunon? Answer I don't recall. I actually talked to a number of people over several days and I don't know who I called or didn't call. Do you remember giving that testimony? Yes, I do. All right. So is it true that you called from area code 310-278-6342 on the night of October 31st, right after these um, alleged threats were made? Objection. This case is the uh, testimony. Um, I did call people from that, uh, from that phone number. Absolutely, I did. And one of the people you called was your wife? I definitely called my wife. And your wife was at home when you called her, correct? Yes, she was. She was in the 818 area code, correct? Yes, she was. And have you taken a look at your phone records to see if that's uh, cooperated? I know I haven't. Exhibit 111. Can I put you in front? Yes. Showing you exhibit number 111. Do you recognize this document as your November 4th, 1989 phone bill from your office, doctor? Uh, it looks to be. All right. And if I could just direct you to the last couple of. in yellow beginning on the first page of this bill. You will see for dates other than October 24th, there are calls to the 818 area code. Do you see that, for instance, October 24th? There's a call to 818-335-2029. Yes. All right. Let's take a look at October 31st. On the first page of this exhibit, there are three 
three calls highlighted in yellow on the 31st, correct? Correct. You made a call at 9.58 a.m. or somebody did from your office to somewhere in California in the 818 area code? Appears to be. At 9.58 a.m., correct? Someone did. So that would have been before this session took place, right? Right. And the second two calls highlighted here is a call made at 3.26 p.m. And another at 3:36 p.m. Correct. That's correct. Those were all made before this session. Right. And you'll see on page <coughs> four of the records again highlighted your October 31st billing is a call made at 9:57 a.m., one made at 10:34 a.m., and one made at 3:01 p.m. Correct. Correct. Those are the only calls made on the 31st on that page. Those are the only calls that are toll calls on that page. Right. Right. And on page five, there are nine calls made, correct? Appears to be. And the there's a call made at all the calls predate four o'clock when the session began, correct? Correct. With the exception of a call which was made at 4.35 p.m. to Plainsboro, New Jersey. Right. Did you make that call? Certainly did not. How about the call at 4.42 p.m. to Princeton, New Jersey? Nope. Another call at 4.42 p.m. to Plainsboro, did you make that call? Nope. How about the call at 6.32 p.m. to New York? No. I don't believe so. I don't recall any of those numbers. All right. I think you said yesterday that you <clears throat> or a couple of days ago that one of the phone calls you made was to a police department outside the Los Angeles area? Well, outside the Los Angeles area, I mean, it could have been uh, Culver City or it could have been uh, uh, Pasadena. It wasn't somewhere in the middle of the state. It was just some small separate police department somewhere around and I don't recall which small city it was. It could have been anything. And was the, do you see any of the calls there on the 31st that could, uh, reflect any police departments or attorneys that you call? Um, I, I think that uh, the, the answer is that um, I don't know that any of the calls that I made would have been toll calls. Um, I, don't, I don't know why you're assuming they would be toll calls. Well, do you see calls to the 818 area code on there? The call, yes, yes, but the, yes, but the 818 area code, my home, calling from my office to my home was not a toll call. The best of my recollection. Absolutely not. You see no 818 area code? I see no 818 my phone numbers on this whole bill, and I call my, my home probably uh, you know 10 times a day. Uh, so I absolutely believe that there that it was not a toll call to my home. Right. And do you think you made it from that phone? Yes. You're positive that you made it from that number? I'm. That's the best of my recollection. I mean, I have a memory of it. And are there any toll calls on there outside your area code that you recognize as having been associated with your calls to people, such as attorneys or police chiefs or anybody else? You're referring to October 31st? October 31st. I see no toll calls that indicate that I made calls out of area, and I had a wide area that was covered within my phone bill that was not a toll call. Um, I see no toll calls, um, but these are not calls, they're toll calls. And do you have any record that you made the calls? No, I didn't keep a record of making the calls. Right. Now, I think you said that when you called your wife that night, you told her, one of the things you told her was that you were going to have to go stay with Miss Smith that night. Is that right? That's correct. Did you tell your wife that the reason for that was because you had a confidential relationship with Miss Smith? No, I didn't. What did you tell her? I believe that I just told her that I needed to stay with Miss Smith and I, I probably shouldn't be... Uh, um, anywhere near her that night because uh, my belief was that um, that Eric particularly knew where I lived and I thought that the most dangerous place for me to be going that night was to my own home. And did you tell your wife why uh, you needed to go to Miss Smith's? I think I just testified that that's about the totality of I recall having said to my wife. Did you need a reason to go to Miss Smith's? In other words, were you free to spend the night there without this um, explanation that there was a threat? No, I think that um, once my wife heard about the threat, I don't think she was particularly concerned about me spending the uh, night 
um, at Miss Smith's house, I think that she was focused on the threat, not not that. No, but my question is, did you need a reason in order to stay at Miss Smith's house? In other words, were you free to stay overnight at your girlfriend's house, or did you need some specific reason in order for you to spend the night there? Um, I don't know how to answer that except to say that I didn't uh, just spend nights at Miss Smith's house and not uh, not uh, go home. So yes, I needed a reason. All right. And in this case, the reason that you gave to Ms. Smith was that she was potentially threatened, correct? N no, I wouldn't say that at all. Well, what reason did you give Ms. Smith as to why you needed to come over to spend the night with oh, her? Oh, yes, I, I told her that, that uh, I had been, uh, <laughs> that I perceived that there was a danger and I needed to have some place to stay. And she told you to come on over, correct? Best of my recollection. And then that night, you went over and spent the night with her, and where'd you go the next day, which would have been the 1st, November 1st? I don't recall. I think I just stayed, I think I stayed um, with uh, Ms. Smith um, pretty much through the week and through the weekend, trying to stay away from uh, my home and, uh, and being anywhere where I could be easily located. And that weekend, I think you testified, you took Miss Smith to a, uh, a weekend in Newport Beach, correct? Yeah, we left town to avoid being found by going to Newport Beach. That's well, correct. Was that a uh, weekend that you had planned prior to this, uh, these two sessions? No. And how did you explain that one to your wife? What did you say to her as to why you needed to go to New Newport Beach with Miss Smith? I said, I think that you better be out of town, which they did go out of town, and I better be out of town because um, I think that uh, um, these, uh, these people are not going on vacation and I feel very threatened by that. So you need to not be anywhere where you could be located and I need to be someplace where I won't be located and so does Smith. And did you indicate to your, or explain to your wife why it was that you needed to go to Newport Beach with Miss Smith as opposed to going wherever it was that you sent your wife? Yes. W what did you explain to her in that regard? that I, I wanted to make absolutely certain that I didn't expose um, uh, my wife or my children to uh, being with me, which would make me much more identifiable as a unit, didn't want to be checking in under my name, wanted to have her be a totally separate place to make sure that there wasn't any possibility that, uh, that, uh, that I could be followed with her going on vacation. I didn't want to be followed with her. And is it true then that you were less concerned about Miss Smith's safety? No. I that think is, you were willing to take that chance with her? No, I think it uh, be, would be much more accurately stated that I thought that it was dramatically less likely that they would have any idea where Miss Smith um, lived to be following me from Miss Smith's house. It wasn't impossible, but it's much less likely. And I thought if I went to my own home, picked up my kids and family, and then went on vacation with them, I thought that would be a much easier way to find where I was. And I also thought that Ms. Smith might need some protection by being with me, since I had already warned her that I thought she was in danger. So the best solution in my mind at that time was for me to be protecting Ms. Smith by taking her out of town, and for me to be protecting my family by having them go to a different location. All right, and did you keep them in that basic constellation for a long period of time? I don't know about a long period of time, I think past the weekend, or through the weekend. Well, did the threat automatically disappear at the end of the weekend when you came home from your weekend? No, it didn't automatically disappear. How did you decide to come back from your weekend at Newport Beach with Ms. Smith in relation to the threat? Um, I just think that I talked a lot of the weekend, uh, um, talked things through, and I think that uh, when I came back, I felt that I couldn't stay uh, I couldn't stay forever on vacation, so um, that wasn't a permanent solution to dealing with the problem. You couldn't stay forever on vacation. Was couldn't stay away. Couldn't, couldn't stay out of town. Permanent. Well, you you said vacation. Was, I said was it this on, a vacation for you? No, I'm amending that. All right. And when you came back from the weekend vacation, what, whatever, where where did you take up residence? Uh, I believe uh, it was my own home. Can't recall specifically which day I returned to my own home. Well, was there some reason why you thought the home was now a safe place to be after your vacation? Didn't think the home was a safe place. Took a lot of measures uh, to increase my security to protect myself at my home. Well, you didn't buy the shotguns till the 6th, right? That's correct. What, when did you get back from Newport Beach? Um, I don't recall the date. I guess uh, you'd have to sort of work backwards. I don't have a calendar. If you gave me a calendar, I could. <laughs> how about if I open this one? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. 
it appears that I would have gotten back from uh, a moment here from Newport Beach, approximately uh, the sixth. Which was what day? Um, a Monday. So I don't know if I'm looking at the right year. I think I'm looking at 89. Is that correct? Yeah, 89. Yeah, it should be November uh -huh. 89. November 6. So you can't. You were down there from Friday night until Monday. I believe so. But were you able to have any enjoyment at all down there on this weekend? Um, I don't believe I had uh, very much enjoyment at all that weekend. Well, were you able to go out of your room, or did you feel so fearful that you had to lock yourself in a hotel room? No, I believe that we went out of our room. Where'd you go? I don't recall. Just to dinner, I think. Did you lay out at the pool at all? I don't recall having been out of the pool. Go to the beach? I don't recall having been to the beach. And uh, when you came back, you went directly to your house, or where'd you go when you came back? I don't recall. All I recall is that, um, that ultimately after that uh, weekend, um, that I did go back to my home. And did you instruct your wife that after this weekend with Miss Smith, she could now come back to your home, that it was safe? I never said anything about it being safe. I only said I thought we needed to take a lot of security measures. Well, did you tell her she could come back to the house? I told her I thought I couldn't stay away permanently, and neither could she, and we had to figure out a way to be secure within the house. And so did you tell her, let's meet back in town, and we'll go and buy some shotguns, and, and then move back into the house? No, I don't think that it uh, happened that way at all. Well, how did it happen? I don't recall. After I was back um, in the house, mm -hmm. We had uh, some discussion about increasing our security, and one of many measures that we took was to buy the shotguns. Well, the many measures, the only other measure you took was to have your security system updated, correct? That's incorrect. You had your security system updated on November 16th, correct? That's I don't remember the dates. If a security person testified, that's when they came out and reactivated your system. Would that be inaccurate testimony? I don't know. I don't recall. Did you feel that the threat continued between November 6th and November 16th? Yes, I did. When did the threat go away? Never did. Never did, up to the time when the, the uh, brothers were arrested, correct? N never did. And did your, um, you receive these shotguns on the 6th? Um, best of my recollection. And when was it decided that um, you'd be better off moving Miss Smith into your house? Uh, I didn't decide that I'd be better off moving Miss Smith into my house. Well, at some point she ended up living in your house, correct? Uh, yes, she did. Was that related to her fear or yours or some other reason? No, that was related to her fear. And what did you explain to your wife as to why your girlfriend was going to move into the house with you? I explained to her that, um, that Miss Smith had said that she was terrified now to be left alone in her place with my going back to live with my wife and family after all this was over with, and um, that she felt very insecure and very frightened and didn't feel that she could um, feel safe or secure alone, and that she felt in a complete bind. And she asked me if, um, out of her fear, that something would happen to her, she felt sort of abandoned, if you will, and asked me if she could come and stay um, at our house for a while um, until she got to the place where she felt less threatened. And so I told my wife that that was a situation, that she was afraid to live alone, and that um, under the circumstances, I thought that um, for a little while it might be okay to have her uh, stay there until her own fear level abated. Well, how long did she stay in your house? Um, it was several months, but I don't recall the exact amount of time. Roughly? Well, I think it was sometime between, uh, sometime in December uh, through, I think, the first part of March. I think you testified back on August 5th that one of the reasons why you felt it necessary to involve Ms. Smith in this, although you characterized her as unstable, was that she had continued to assert herself in terms of trying to stay in the relationship. Do you remember that testimony? 
Uh, yeah, but I don't know that I said that that was the reason that I had her come and stay in the house. I think that that uh, may, it certainly was true. No, no she you kept misunderstand coming. me. I yes. said one of the reasons why you said that you initially involved her in this situation was because she had continued to assert herself in terms of trying to stay in the relationship. Well, it went beyond that. But yes, she did. Uh, she, she did continue to try to assert herself in the relationship, but it went uh, dramatically beyond that. And when you say it went dramatically beyond that, do you mean to say that she was basically pursuing you in a way that you didn't think was uh, appropriate? I would go beyond that. Why don't you characterize how, how far beyond that you'd go? Well, each time that I told her that I didn't want to be in the relationship, she would um, uh, threaten to commit suicide. Um, and in fact, uh, one point did threaten to commit, did in fact attempt to commit suicide. And so at the, uh, at the time that um, this all took place, October 31st, um, within two weeks before that, as I uh, told her that I was um, going to wrap up things and not, not be able to see her, uh, anymore, she had uh, uh, she written a suicide note and um, basically uh, stated that she wasn't going to live anymore if I wasn't going to let her uh, continue to uh, see me in some way. By the way, uh, Miss Smith was not only your girlfriend; she was your patient, was she not? Absolutely not. That's not true. No, it's not true. Did, did you ever uh, diagnose her? No, I did not. Did you ever consult with her over the phone? No, I did not. Not in a professional way. Well, how, what do you mean by that? I talked with her for phone, phone conversation, the same kind of conversation that uh, I'd have with a friend. Did you do telephone consultations where you did the diagnosis? No, I didn't. <coughs> so that uh, 112... You're asking for an exhibit to be marked, is that yeah, right? Next in order would be exhibit 12. It's a half a page letter dated September 3rd, 1989. Yes, we'll take our recess, and uh, at this point, it's a quarter to the hour. We'll resume at 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't be in a position where others discuss it in your presence. And. Uh, don't form any final opinions about it, and we'll resume at 1.30. Both juries return to their respective jury rooms. All people in the audience, please stay put until the jurors leave. All right, the uh, jurors have left the courtroom. Uh, just a uh, few remarks before we deal with the exhibit. The remark has to do with the conduct of counsel uh, during the questioning of the witness, specifically that of Ms. Abramson and mugging to the audience uh, during the testimony of the witness. Was there some reason for that? I don't agree that I What were you doing when you looked towards the audience, smiled, and uh, got a reaction from a lady in the audience? I was looking at a family And her reaction to you was what? She was smiling at me when I turned around. She was still smiling. And you're saying you weren't smiling or mugging at her, rolling your eyes, or anything of that nature? I was smiling at her. She's the defendant's why were you smiling at her during the witness's testimony? Because I know what they think of what the witness is saying, and I was offered support. And if the prosecution would do the same during the, your client's testimony, how would you react to that? As long as it wasn't in front of the jury, it wouldn't matter to me. Well, counsel, the jury is right behind you and to yeah, your left. You don't think they can look back and see you? I could see your eyes rolling when you're facing the witness. <laughs> The jury can't see that either. There's a jury in the jury box who could easily see what you're doing. All right. I will try. Is there some, no, not try. You will succeed in not mugging for the jury, not making faces to the audience. You will behave professionally. Is that clear? Yes, of course. Right. And if it happens again, I'm not going to deal with it in this fashion. Right. And the lady in the audience, what is your name? My name's Sarah. Yes. Marta. Marta, my name is Karen. Okay. I don't recall, I uh, don't know who you were looking at, but uh, she reacted as well as the young lady in front. I don't know who she is. I wasn't looking at her. All right. Uh, Ma'am, you are, if you want to remain in this courtroom during these proceedings, you are not to react at all to what goes on during these proceedings. Do you understand that? And if you can't follow that simple instruction, you will not be permitted to remain in the courtroom. Do you understand? Yes. 
Yes. Sir. All right. The young lady in front. What is your name? Summer Lafrenier. Excuse what? Me. Summer Lafrenier. Yeah, are you related to anybody involved in this case? I'm related to one of the attorneys. Which one? Jill Lance. Okay. Again. If you want to be in this courtroom during these proceedings, you're instructed not to react in any way to what goes on. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Right, and that applies to everybody in the audience during the entire process of this trial. Your Honor, I don't know if the court's aware that Ms. Cano is going to be a witness for the defense. We have allowed her to stay because, she, in fact, she is a family member. And we have not made a motion to exclude, even though we're aware of her presence and aware of the fact she's, that she's on the witness list. But we can't monitor, you know, we can't conduct the trial by looking in the audience the whole time. So perhaps at this time it would be prudent to have her excluded until she testifies. I believe it will be this week. I think she's going to be testifying within the first few witnesses. Is that correct? Is she going to be a witness call this week? Yes, she is. And is there some reason why she should remain in the courtroom rather than be excluded until she testifies? It's just that it hasn't been the policy to exclude family members until they testify. All right, um, I will permit her to stay, but if I see any reaction whatsoever from her at all, or if I hear of any, then she will be excluded. I understand. All right, and uh, I don't take this uh, entire matter lightly like uh, counsel might. This is a very serious uh, part of the trial, and if counsel feel that they can make editorial comment during the testimony of the witnesses by reacting to it, uh, they're very much mistaken and the court would take very strong corrective actions if it recurs.